but those kind of sets where it's like down the middle, that's not exciting for me. And I think people in the crowd can have a fine time at a show that I would rate as like a, you know, a C and they leave and they're like, that was fun. But I just know how good it can be. And I know like what I'm capable of. And specifically when I'm able to improvise the entire show, which I've been trying to do, um, you know, whether that be crowd work or riffing or just talking about my day, those are exciting shows. And I can get off stage after those and be like, that was good. Sam Talent, thank you for joining me on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Zach. It's nice to be here. Great to be here. So I was doing a little stalking of some previous interviews of yours, and I was reading that you actually were reading The Hustler by Walter Tevis yeah, while you were while you were writing your novel, which is absolutely, you know, awesome, by the way, running the light. We're oh, going to talk you. about that. Um, dive deeper yeah, that into that. Yeah, that book is perfect, dude. Yeah. I mean, my book, not my book. The hustler. That, yes, your book is perfect. <laughs> wow, that's sweet. But yeah, uh, uh, I love that book. Yeah, so I, I I was reading that you were you know going through that book as you were writing Running the Light, and I actually had never I, I've never read that book. I ordered the used copy on Amazon as a, a recommendation from you, so yeah. I appreciate that. And I looked up a quote from the book though, just as a teaser. Maybe people listening to this have read it. Maybe they haven't, but I don't think anyone's of, read it. <laughs> I don't think it's, it's like a, a movie. It's a movie. Name. It's a movie too, right? Though it's a, it was a pretty popular movie. movie, The Hustler. Yeah, yeah. It's an amazing film. It's about a, a pool shark uh, travels around. You know, makes some mistakes. Uh, there's like a redemption arc where he plays a guy named Minnesota Fats, who was played by uh, Jackie Gleason in the film, mm. and that rules. He's so good in that. So there's a line in the book and Walter Tevis writes, the whole goddamn thing is you got to commit yourself to the life that you picked. So I wanted to ask you, what are the most difficult parts of the life that you've picked, which is stand up comedy? Uh, I don't know, man, being gone. Well, there's uh, when I when I, when I started doing stand up, it was fun because you uh, you're with a bunch of other people who were afraid, who are embarking on this like really difficult thing, which is learning how to be funny in front of, at that point, like very apathetic drunk strangers at uh, dive bars and whatnot. And it's just so exciting. Uh, You know, like your, for lack of a better term, like your class of comedians you start with. I'm still like, you know, I've been in their weddings. They've been in my weddings. Like the, uh, those bonds that we forge, uh, it's just so great. But then as you get you know, further along in stand up, you lose your friends, move away, you move away from your friends, that sense of community kind of, uh, you know, disappears. And then, uh, you know, now there's a whole concern of like, okay, I have to make sure I'm, I've, I get door deals now as opposed to guarantees. And there's the financial fear of like, is anyone coming to the shows in Minneapolis this weekend? Uh, where's the hotel? Do we need to rent a car? There's just a lot of like day to day stuff that, uh, isn't there when you're just like eager to try and be funny in front of strangers. And then of Mm. course, like being away from my wife, um, being on the road, going to the airport every weekend, uh, that kind of stuff, just like that slog of travel that can be a bit daunting, but, uh, you know, it's not throwing bales of hay. It's not digging fence posts. It's a, I'm very grateful. And I have really, really hard time complaining about any aspect of, uh, being a comedian. Yeah. So being like, you, it sounds like, you know, you, you start this thing as an open micer and I'm a huge fan of stand up. I've never done an open mic or performed Good. on stage or anything like that. Good. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> yeah. No. Why? Uh, I mean, if you really like, if, if it's something that keeps you up late at night or you think you have, you know, a calling, uh, then you should try it. But I don't think it's something that you dabble in. Like if you want to be a comedian and you want to like be a good comedian, you really have to let it uh, nearly kill you uh, to have success in this field. Yeah, no, it it doesn't it doesn't keep me up late at night. And stand up comedy is not the thing that will ultimately kill me <laughs> at some yeah. point. I I don't know. I, like I remember watching Chris Rock when he was on HBO late night when you actually had to find him on TV you had to be up you know, 
in eighth grade at 11 o'clock at night and go on HBO late night. And it was either porn or softcore porn or Chris Rock, you know. Um, and that decision just, was really hard to make. I'm, I'm amazed that you were able to watch rock instead of uh, Red Shoe Diaries. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> well, you know, you could, you, there was HBO one and two, so you could switch back and forth. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and Chris Rock was pretty cool, uh, because you could, uh, switch, you had the back channel, the last channel button. So yeah. God forbid someone walks in and, uh, you can just be like, oh, I'm laughing really hard underneath this blanket. That's yeah. why I'm so sweaty. And his name isn't that far away from a porn name. It's like Chris Rocked. Oh, yeah, Chris Rick Cox. Cox. That guy's yeah. probably made some money. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but I, I remember seeing guys like him on TV when I was, you know, 12 or 13. And just How old having are you, Zach? 29. Just turned nice. 29. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This is, you know, 10 years before I ever started podcasting. But I remember seeing standups and you know just other people that were on a tv that were famous for it and not really thinking that i want to make what they're making but i want to i'm interested in the ingredients and i guess the only way to find out what those are are through conversation so that's just a long-winded way of saying that i wouldn't die for stand-up but i am very interested in the art of conversation and I just have vivid memories of thinking like, wow, I'd really like to fucking, you know, talk to Chris Rock as a 13 year old kid. And, oh, he, yeah. you know, he'd probably think I was a fucking idiot even now, you know, 20 months, <laughs> not much better. But yeah, I remember how important those Comedy Central presents the half hours they used to have. And like uh, I was on vacation one time with my family and we were about to go to the beach on Anna Maria Island, Florida. And this was the one vacation we took every year. We'd go somewhere and we'd go swimming. And, uh, like, I think it was, uh, Ted Alejandro, his half hour came on and my mom and dad, like yelling at me, like, we have to go. And I was like, no, but this is so important to my little young mind is to watch the Ted Alejandro half hour in this hotel yeah. room in Florida, as opposed to like, you know, going snorkeling. Uh, yeah. Stand up really put its, uh, it put its boot on my neck, uh, pretty early and for better or for worse, it's defined my adult life. When when was that moment where you felt like the boot was pressing down, like the first pressure from it? Man, it's weird. There's uh there's home videos of me, two and a half, three years old. I mean, I guess that no, it was it, when, I, when I had language skills. So whenever that is, I guess my niece is two and a half and she's barely talking. But uh, there's like home videos of me like sliding in, like my parents being like, and now coming to the stage, Sam Talent. And I slide in on my knees in like a little suit and do stand up bits, you know, like a child's version of bits and stuff. Um, so I think it was just, it was always something that I desired to do before <laughs> I even have like conscious memory of making that decision. So you, did you stick with the, like like at three years old, that's a really long time to hang on to the same dream. Was that a constant from three till the first time you did stand up? Were you, was that a phase till you were six years old? And then, you know, from seven to 15, you wanted to be something else and then went back to stand up? I don't like know, man. It's weird. Cause like I was, I was, uh, I play, I was a very big jock. I was a football player and a wrestler. So like, right around third grade and it was just like sports year round, you know, basketball, football, wrestling, baseball. Um, that was like a big part of my childhood, but like it, as definitive as like the Denver Broncos winning the Super Bowls in the nineties, also like Ghostbusters and, uh, you know, stripes and like the Chris Farley films and all the happy Madison productions, like all those movies. I think that I, I, I didn't think I was going to be a stand up comedian, like alone on stage it was always a more of a matter of like, I'm going to be like a funny, like a, like a sketch performer, like a Saturday Night Live, Mad TV, uh, an improviser. Like I always thought it'd be like a team aspect to it. I never thought I would be a, the lone wolf comedian. But yeah, as far as like wanting to be funny for like a living, that was always a big part of uh, what I thought I would wind up doing. Yeah, it's it's interesting, the solo aspect of a pursuit versus having a team around you because there are costs and benefits to both. W when I was younger, I focused on tennis for a really long time. I was way better at tennis than baseball, but I just you guys hated are psychos. I tennis hated running. I hate 
I agree. I agree. I hated running. Uh, I was also pretty you chubby. Tennis was a way out of running. You didn't think no, you would I have hated, to move around I hate, much. I hated running, so I quit <laughs> okay. tennis. I okay. quit tennis because I hated yeah. running, and I started. Uh, I, I was playing baseball and tennis at the same time. I was way better at tennis, and then I stopped tennis to focus on pitching because yeah. in my mind I was like, I get to breathe for thirty seconds in between every pitch, yeah. and I and I'd rather try to throw hard as shit every thirty seconds then constantly be running around and be tired after five minutes oh yeah but, but i remember like just the feeling of being alone on the court and having my serve go in tennis and there's literally no one else that can take it back except me like it's such a mind fuck that you have to get yourself back into the game whereas oh, yeah. pitch pitching you know i could you know, there's so many times where I threw a terrible pitch and the ball was hit 120 miles an hour right at my left fielder yeah. for an out. Like it should have been like in a fair game, he should be on second base or third base, sure. but it's just right at the person. And so my teammates could pick me up. But just you talking about the the solo pursuit of stand up comedy versus the sketch comedy, improv, things like that. I imagine, you know, y you had that battle with do i want other people on stage with me to pick me up or do i want it to be my total responsibility for whether sure. this goes great or terribly yeah i mean there the uh the collaborative aspects of improv specifically long form improv uh i've never had more fun or like uh i've never had like more like uh i don't know i don't want to sound too highfalutin but like the most fun i've ever had on stage was definitely doing improv with two other guys in Denver. Cause I started doing improv before I did stand up. I did improv from 18 to about 21, like every weekend, that's where I was. And performing with those guys was the best. But then when you got thrown in situations where the other people were not, uh, maybe they didn't share the same sense of humor as you, or they weren't, um, as, uh, as eager to be adventurous and explore, uh, certain areas of the imagination, uh, you're kind of hamstrung um, by the people who are in your group. So um, I tried stand up just because it was another way to get on stage. Like I was always on stage growing up from like the first grade on, I was in every play, every musical. Uh, I did not uh, play basketball my senior or junior year of high school so I could be in the musical. Um, I was like the only, I think I'm still the only person in Colorado high school sports history who was a all-state uh, football player and also a member of the Thespian Society. So, I mean, I got my thousand hours in theater. I got my thousand hours in football. Like, uh, it's very bizarre to think about how important team stuff is for me because now I'm alone out there. But I love being part of a team. I miss being a part of a team. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So... It, it, they're definitely different sports. I think tennis is the same thing as like wrestling, whereas it's a game that's kind of goes on inside of your head more than it does in the physical world. I mean, of course you're running around, of course you're hitting the ball, of course there's hand-eye coordination, but to have the, uh, I mean, the, the mental wherewithal specifically in wrestling, because I'd never really played tennis uh, seriously. Obviously, I'm six five, three hundred pounds. But like you'd you know, be like like, uh, like a wrecking ball, just hundred fifty mile an hour serve. Just, you don't even have have, to. You, you don't even have to worry about moving. You just have, you just ace every oh, yeah. stroke, and then you don't you just have walk. to pound balls. So I did not have to do any movement after that serve. I picture you being a headband, like a big headband guy playing tennis. Oh, yeah. oh you, for sure. Like ace, the shortest shorts, the and biggest then just, headband, and then walk. Like you ace, and then you just walk with swagger to the next box. Yeah. Like you don't even look to see if it was an ace. Like you just call for the ball boy for the next ball as you're walking to the box. <laughs> no, I would probably be, uh, I mean, this is a hypothetical world where I'm good at tennis, I guess, but I can imagine myself just being so embarrassed to be playing tennis in front of anyone in the crowd because of my, uh, my specific physical attributes. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, I would love to, uh, I'd love to pound some balls. I love to drive on a, you know, you, you, you go to the golf course and you just hit balls. That's fun, but I have no short game or anything. Do you have a Burt Kreischer gene where you can just not do something for your whole life and then someone just throws you a pitch and you hit a home run or you just walk on the tennis court, do something, 
and you're just naturally athletic for no reason at all? I mean, I can play basketball effectively, um, and I still have tremendous balance for someone of my size, but that just comes from like, mm. you know, playing basketball. The only, the only athletic thing I do these days is, uh, is I like to ride my bike every day and go swimming if possible. Mm. But, uh, yeah, I'm not, I don't think that I have the Burt Kreischer, uh, gift of just natural athleticism. So you go, you go from sketch comedy theater in high school or, or from theater into improv sketch yeah. after high school. Yeah. And and that, so then at what point did you say, you know, screw the sketch, screw the improv and just exclusively start doing open mics or, or just start going to open mics in general? It's a real murky time. Uh, Cause I was going to play football and then I hurt my knee. So then I found myself attending a commuter school in Denver. So I lived in downtown Denver. I moved there when I was like right out of high school, 18 years old. And my mother for my 18th birthday gift, she bought me a tattoo and she signed me up for classes at the Bovine Metropolis theater in their improv level one. And by level for your three, 18th I was birthday, your, your mom gifted birthday. you a cat t- uh, tattoo. Yeah. And uh-huh. the bovine improv membership or yes. cla- class. Yeah. It's a cool so, ass yeah. mom. Oh, she was the greatest. The greatest. What was the tattoo that you chose? Uh, or did she choose a... it? That would have been even funnier. Like, I'll pay for your tattoo, but I get to fucking choose. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a fun prank. Uh, no, I mean, I, if she would have asked me to get like the mom heart tattoo, like I have that, you know, on my wrist now that I chose to nice. get on my own. And then I have her more memorialized on my chest here, her name. But uh, it was a, it was a it was a, a song lyric from a band called Against Me, uh, and the lyric is the advantage is taken when no one is looking, which uh, sounds murky. Like tennis. Yes, exactly. So yeah, <laughs> like the way that I thought about it was like when no one's telling me to go do something because I you know I I enjoy I back then was fucking stoned every day and it was very easy for me to like be lazy and uh, be into like the pleasures of the flesh. <laughs> so uh, it was just a way for me to like remind myself to go do work when no one was demanding it of me. Yeah. Yeah. I had, I, I had a similar feeling with baseball when I was still playing. I, I played up until 23. Now I'm a fully washed up college baseball player. My rules. Um, Lucy played. I didn't even get to play college ball. I signed, but then I couldn't play. It was fun. It was fun. I I definitely had that feeling of getting the work done when no one was looking, which eventually helped with podcasting. You know, I would go to the cages, do extra throwing, stretching, mobility, gave a fuck about school for maybe a year. And then after that, school was just a way to have a scholarship to continue to play and then eventually become a pro baseball player. Mm -hmm. That ended up not happening. But I had this like singular focus left over, this engine that I built over four or five years, because uh, you always got to take a victory lap. And <laughs> I didn't know what to do with it, and I didn't want to do accounting, which was my degree. Yeah. And so I just started interviewing music artists and then put the engine on that. But I, I remember what starting, like I had this drive to do something with my life, and I didn't want to do the thing that I was supposed to do. Right. And I needed a place to put that engine besides just getting fucked up and oh, hanging yeah. out. And that's what's weird is like, I'm, it's strange because especially with comedians, there's so few people who come from, I mean, I don't want to say so few people. There are not as many people who come from like a serious sports background in comedy. Um, and I'm like so grateful for all the years that I played team sports. Like it was formative. And I've said this before, it sounds insane. I think that being an offensive lineman made me a very good host or MC for comedy shows because I knew it wasn't about me. And I was like there to serve the goals of the entire show, you know, set the table so the feature and the headliner can do good. And that's because as an offensive lineman for nine years, I never touched the damn ball. Um, There's actually a lot of like, I mean, there's more, there's a higher percentage of women in comedy who played sports seriously as opposed to like men. Um, So like, it's weird just to have this Mm. jock mindset because it's totally alien to a lot of the people who uh, are also like, yeah, I'm sharing green rooms with and stuff. And I definitely like had that chip on my shoulder going into comedy where I was like, 
I'm going to be the best. I'm going to be undeniable. And, you know, if I had like a rough set or even a decent set, if I had a set where I didn't kill, I'd always get off stage and be like, fuck, that sucked. And my friends would be like, no, if a, if a lot of people have that set, they would be happy about it. But you like got a B instead of an A. So now you're going to like flagellate yourself. And I mean, yeah, mm. I did. And I think that that helped me uh, get ahead because I didn't, I never took it easy on myself, you know? How did you, so, so if you take football, go back to football, you're, you're an mm -hmm. offensive lineman, there's a very clear, definitive line of whether you did your job or you didn't and Correct. whether you win or you lose the game and stand up comedy, you know, j just as an audience member, I've been a part of a bunch of sets where people killed uh mm -hmm. you know i thought people were very funny when maybe the audience didn't react the same way mm -hmm. and vice versa where i didn't think someone was very funny but the audience reacted like they were everything in between so how do you create the basis to lash yourself or congratulate yourself and stand up like what is the marking of a set that deserves you basking in that like the the afterglow of a good set and what are the definitive marks of a, a bad set? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know if it's quantifiable. Um, I don't know if there's like a metric for what's good or what's bad, but you can, like, I can definitely tell when it's going okay. Obviously anyone can tell when it's going bad. The crowd can tell when it's going bad. You can tell when it's going bad. Um, but those kind of sets where it's like down the middle, that's not exciting for me. And I think people in the crowd can have a fine time at a show that I would rate as like a, you know, a C and they leave and they're like, that was fun. But I just know how good it can be. And I know like what I'm capable of. And specifically when I'm able to improvise the entire show, which I've been trying to do, um, you know, whether that be crowd work or riffing or just talking about my day, those are exciting shows. And I can get off stage after those and be like, that was good. Um, so yeah, I, I can, I, it's, I wish I could like put it more poetically, but it's either I get off and I'm like, that was good. Or I get off and I don't want to go out and sell merch. I don't want to mm -hmm. talk to anyone after the show. I just want to lock myself in the green room and, uh, wait for the next show to redeem myself. Um, yeah, I don't know. And I think that I don't, I don't think comedians give crowds enough credit. Um, you know, there's like a hive mind that occurs when people are sitting in the same room watching the same thing. And, uh, there's also like a lowering of the bar in comedy right now, where it's like all about viral clips that are a minute long. And it's just people doing like the most base, often vulgar, crude, lazy crowd work. And then that's rewarded by people clicking. And, uh, that's definitely not why I got into comedy, which was to, uh, you know, ask a lady in the front row if she's Chinese and then have people laugh at that, you know? Like, I think that there's stuff that we can do that's still exciting. And uh, this whole, like, short clips thing is kind of like encouraging people in the crowd to try and participate in the show more than I think they should have the right to. And also it's lowering their attention span and lowering the bar for uh, what is, quote unquote, good comedy. So again, I've been doing this since I was 18. I'm 35 now. So I sound like I'm a thousand years old whenever I talk about this stuff, but that's just like my feelings on it. And I don't know if they're right or wrong, but that's just my feeling. No, that that's good. That's, that's perspective. And yeah, Instagram reels, uh, a lot of crowd work reels specifically, like you were saying that just a lot of, and I, again, I don't know if it's good or bad. I watch them. I follow a lot of comedians but it's a lot of big highlighty text, a lot of, you know, asking basic questions, which I, I've been there for basic questions like that in person that have been hilarious and when they haven't worked. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. There's like a, the same way there's a hypnosis aspect in stand up comedy. There's also a hypnosis aspect on social media where I'm not really sure why I watched something like mm -hmm. I watch crowd work clips and I don't even know sometimes if it's funny, but it was engaging and it made me watch the whole thing. And then that added to the algorithm. And then now Instagram's going to promote that to someone else. And 
the text grabs you, the cuts, like so you're always like moving slightly in the video. The so, clickbait titles. Yeah, click clickbait titles. And some of them yeah. are good. Like I, I like a lot of them. I, I like um it's it's entertaining and s- there are a few that genuinely make me laugh out loud. But the, yeah, there is a lot of like you could tell it's almost for the real where no oh, for sure that where it's they're asking the question the and algorithm I, yeah, yeah like and i've even gotten that feeling sometimes in person when yes. i'm at a when i'm at a set where i'm like oh this is the real part yes. like this is for the 60 seconds and then yeah. you know it's uh it, it it seems like the comedy it, it's even affecting the flow of comedy somewhat yes. where people really aren't telling stories anymore as much because you can't put a seven minute story that has ebbs and flows, down moments into a 60 second reel. It's just like da 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 da. Mm-hmm. And that's re- that could be really funny, but I, I do enjoy the story aspects more for sure than like the quick, the quick just set up punchline, set up punchline. Yeah, no, I mean, it's good that people are, uh, you know, actively engaging and consuming stand up. And if that comes in the one minute clip, then I think that's good probably overall for big C comedy, but I don't know if, um, I, I do, I, I'll say this definitively. I don't think it's good when a comedian goes on stage trying to generate a clip. I don't think that you go on stage and you're like, okay, I need to get, um, a new clip for this week. And in order to do that, I'm going to ask someone how long they've been with their wife or where they work and then try and be, uh, as big and hyperbolic with whatever mundane bit of their life they reveal. Um, and it becomes formulaic and everyone kind of starts sounding the same and it's just this like Ouroboros and the snake's eating its own ass. And, uh, I don't like that. Uh, and again, <laughs> I'm not saying that I'm correct. <laughs> That's just my, uh, feeling as someone who's been doing it every fucking weekend for 15 years. Excuse is there, s- uh, no, go ahead. Um, is there someone's social media that you particularly enjoy i mean as far as like the people who do that kind of thing i really like ian fidance ian fidance brings Mm. a bit of glee to uh and like whimsy and joy to what he's doing so if i see an ian clip i'll traditionally watch it um i think jordan jensen does a good job of it because her stuff doesn't seem forced uh but yeah like also i'm not watching much stand-up ever you know um I, 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 it's not something that I like seek out and consume, you know, like I watched Shane's special. It was great. Um, my buddy Rand Barnaclo put out a special recently. It's really good. Uh, but yeah, like I don't, I, if I sit down and watch an hour of stand up, it might happen once a month if it happens four times a year. Was it uh, Shane's the, the, cause he did, a, he did one for Gillian Keeves and then he had the one right, live and in that Texas. Was great too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, everything. I love, he's super funny. Uh, and I'm glad to count him as a friend. Um, yeah, so, yeah, that's good stuff, you know. But I mean, like, if I'm going to, like, sit down and try and watch something funny, like, I'm probably going to watch, like, Dirty Work or, uh, you know, Happy Gilmore or Tommy Boy. Like, that's the kind of stuff that if I'm, like, trying to get a little stone and chill, like, that's what I would put on. And again, that'll happen twice a year. My yeah. wife and I watched uh, Son-in-Law the other day on a lark, and that held up. But, yeah, I don't know, man. There's just, like, so many cool ways to tell stories now. And I don't think that, like, funny is necessarily the most interesting 90 minutes to consume, you know? Because mm. funny, like, there's only, like, one end goal, and that's to make you laugh. And there's not really a lot of, like, leeway for, you know, trying to, like, tell a deeper uh, story where you, like, build uh, relationships and that kind of stuff. Yes, some also, of the. I'm sorry, I get rambly, dude. So if I remember just like fucking talking too much, just tell me to can. No, no, this is the this is the perfect perfect format for it. We we were talking about chat roulette before we started recording. If if yeah. you know one of us is rambling, we could just press the next button and probably get a dick pic instead. But you know we're on the the long form app right now, so that that's yeah. perfect. And I think there's probably like some comparisons to be drawn from the people who grew up going on Omegle and chat roulette and how now they're like searching out like these one minute stand up clips. Stand up's just so big now. It's so boutique. So you can find the exact kind of stand up that you like 
And if you like that stand up, you can follow the algorithm and the suggested reels and they'll show you other stand up that you like. Um, whereas back in the day, it was like only the stuff that was on Conan, only the stuff that was on Letterman or Leno or on Comedy Central. So I guess it's better now that there's more of it. But uh, I think that the more there is of something, the more, uh, you know, that the middle, the uh, the the the. There's very bad, and then there's some good, but then there's just all this shit in the middle that uh, is not exceptional, and people see more of that than I think that should be made available to them. Yeah, I think it's it's better because there's more of it, but it's worse because the algorithm only recommends things that are like the things that you've already seen. Mm -hmm. And I remember things being, or at least seeming much more random back in the day because maybe the algorithm wasn't as good or there were just more random searches popping up. Everything wasn't a suggested feed. There was no sidebar that would start the next thing immediately after. Mm -hmm. But in a, in a world that's better for content consumption and that's more fulfilling for the consumer that I think there should probably be something like a 20% random recommendation maybe 80% of your feed is based off things that you like and then maybe there's a separate funnel for this is the complete opposite of your style of comedy or politics or whatever it is and this is a video you don't have to watch it but this is just the randomly generated feed next to the suggested feed and I don't know exactly what that would look like but I I, I just feel like it's hard to seek out new things sometimes because spotify you know youtube there's always the next thing that it thinks you're gonna like and it's right. so enticing to click on it's hard to get away from that i wish there was something native within the app itself that encouraged more random just you know spur the moment like holy fuck i had no idea this person existed i and i wouldn't have found them and it doesn't make sense but i love this person's music or comedy or whatever it is right and that happened a lot more back in the day when you were like having, you know, obviously it's cool that everyone can like build a platform and build a fan base. But like when you just watched Conan O'Brien every night and the comedian at the end of the night, you had no idea who it was going to be and you've never seen them before. But that's how you find John Doerr. That's how you find Rory Scovel. Um, you know, I do think that there's like a certain level of uh, the random uh, predictability, like especially on Instagram where like. You know, for some reason now on Instagram, I watch a lot of videos of like men in, uh, you know, uh, former Soviet republics like uh, Kazakhstan or Tajikistan or whatever, where they're just like cooking food on rocks near a river, you know, <laughs> like, and I don't, I never searched that out. I didn't know that existed, but these just kind of like ASMR, like, uh, you know, waterside, there's a big rock over a fire and I just caught this fish and they don't say a word. And it's just like them, like always cooking with, you know, onions and whatever leaks they find. I watch that stuff and I don't know where it came from. So I guess I'm grateful to the algorithm for figuring out that I would enjoy that. Yeah. It sounds soothing. I yeah, haven't, it's cool. I haven't it's... stumbled upon that side of Instagram yet, but well, I think that if you, if you like purposely refuse to uh, be horny on Instagram, they start sending you other weird stuff because <laughs> my Instagram is like, I'm very proud of the fact that I don't use it uh, for uh, any perverse uh, stuff. And I think that's just because I'm like a, you know, happily married man and, Maybe my, if I was like 25 and single, good God, you could get lost for hours in the, mm. uh, you know, like I see some of my friends search pages and it's like, this is porno. <laughs> you guys are pigs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, if you don't, if you don't follow a, three Instagram models within your radius within a week, yeah. Instagram, Instagram will be like, all right, he's not horny for women how about let's send him an open fire cook in argentina and see if right. that gets yeah. exactly <laughs> let's, uh, let's see if that the crackling of the steak <laughs> and some wood chips get <sighs> some uh get some aroused see let's no. see what happens and then they're watching through the camera on your phone like okay this is getting him going we've got yeah. him we've got yeah, him back his, his retinas are locked on to this yeah, man people are dilated over yeah. open flame <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> hilarious speaking of you know, random searches or just searches outside the algorithm. I found 
Mishka Shibali, is that his name? Yeah. The guy who made the music yeah, for your Mishka special? Shibali. Yeah. So your special, Waiting for Death to Claim Us, which everyone yeah. should go check out. Thanks, man. It's At on Amazon end, Prime for free. Yes. I actually bought it on YouTube and then I realized Thanks, that it's on man. Prime. So I watched uh, I watched more of it on Prime. So that's that's well, how good that of a would supporter be. I am. That would be a whole own podcast, uh, me talking about the, uh, you know, just that special anyway thank you for watching it and th sorry you had to purchase it that was not i had i have no say about how it was packaged or sold um so no no i anyway it was I, my, digress. I i don't i don't regret purchasing it at all i'm happy to support and i also have it on amazon now when the link awesome. expires so so even better but you have uh the song from your special was written and performed by mishka shibali yeah gideon's and, bible it's and a i great song. yeah and i search him on spotify and i would have never been recommended that if yeah. it wasn't for watching your special messaging you for the podcast like that's something that i wished happened more where spotify goes okay this dude has never listened to anyone even remotely close to mishka shibali yeah let's just flip him up a couple songs and see what happens sure yeah no mishka's great i met him um he's in like the stanhope orbit so i met him and we you know he was invaluable for the uh you know he got me my literary agent he read some of the first drafts of my novel and i'm indebted to him for sure so i'm mm -hmm. glad that he got it that was the, him doing that song obviously i love that song but it was also a way for me to put some cash in his pocket because i was like hey i want to use this song so the production company pay this guy. So yeah, he's a great dude. Yeah. I'm gonna see him next week. So let's go back to the the open mic transition into the you know full time stand up comedian. When did the open mic thing start to become more of a professional pursuit where you could rely on that to get paid? You were doing stand up comedy full time or close to full time. You you could see a window into what you're doing right now yeah um i've worked very hard to not have to wake up at a certain time like i was always like i don't really i would rather like you know i i sacrificed a whole bunch of like comfort and stability for uh not having a boss and uh so like i was i showed like a pretty natural proclivity for stand-up and uh, I got moved up the ranks of, you know, like I got a host and I, I got my own open mic. I got my own, I had two open mics I was hosting. Uh, I got asked to go out and open for guys on the road um, fairly early, like before I was even 20. Because I remember going to like Wyoming and North Dakota and not being able to drink after the shows. So that would always suck. Um, so, yeah, there was like this like weird farm system in Colorado because between Chicago and like. LA effectively we're pretty much the only comedy town uh, at least for the mountain state region uh, I mean Phoenix is down there but as far as like you know the Rocky Mountain region Colorado like we would go do those shows so as soon as I could like pay my rent once off of doing stand-up I dropped out of college much to the chagrin of my mother and father and uh, yeah I was just effectively on the road non-stop from about let's see about 22 years old and I was in bands first. So I like, I knew how to like book and, you know, get shows in different cities. And also people would come to Denver and do my Wednesday night mm. showcase that my friends ran. So they'd be like, Hey, if you're ever going to Indianapolis, hit me up. Like I can, you can stay on my couch or that kind of thing. And then I just like, I would go to cities for like a week and cash in these favors that people probably didn't even, you know, say in sincerity and stay on someone's couch and go do every open mic in that city, whether it was New Orleans, Omaha, Chicago, and then just try and crush the open mics and the small showcases. And that way, the next time I came, um, I could headline the show that's every third Wednesday or, uh, you know, do the Tuesday night showcase that pays 50 bucks. And then the next time I come after that, hopefully I'm like, you know, headlining, you know, uh, uh, you know, Thursday in Tuscaloosa, Friday in Chattanooga, and then go to Atlanta on Saturday and just building this like kind of organic, like the only like real comparison I can make is like the old days of, uh, 
like hardcore punk in like 1980 to like 19, you know, to onward where like Black Flag would go play a city and then, you know, Husker Du would hit them up and say, who books Oklahoma City? And then they just, just like this like network of here's who's here and here's what it pays and here's when it is. And then just like sending Facebook messages, cold emails, that kind of thing to people. And uh, yeah, I've just been like on the road forever. And I don't see that really coming to an end anytime soon. Mm. As much as I like kind of romanticize the idea of like stopping and moving to Spain with my wife and just like writing books and drinking very good vermouth. Like, I don't think I can like effectively quit stand up ever, which is weird. What are those moments when you feel like you actually would move to Spain? Like, what what is it about the idea of quitting and writing or quitting stand up and then going to write exclusively, going to write exclusively, excuse me, that entices you? I don't know, man. It's just like, this is, this is my, this is, it's defined my entire adulthood as being a comedian. And there's only so many times when you can go back to Minneapolis. Um, you know, I don't know. I never, it's not like I'm ever like, God, I hate this. I want to quit. It's just more like, what else is there? And like, kind of being like, you know, it being the way that I generate the majority of my income, um, means that like, I can't stop doing it if I want to maintain the, uh, the life that I have. So it's not like I'll have like a bad show and be like, I want to quit. It's just more like I look at my calendar and I'm booked out to April of next year. And I'm like, when does this end? When is there going to be a gap that isn't just, you know, it's really weird. Like, cause it'll be easy. Someone will hit you up and be like, Hey, I run a comedy festival in Morgantown, West Virginia. Would you want to headline it on March 31st of 2023? And you say, yes. And then you're like signing up your future self for this thing that your current self doesn't have to do. So there's like really no risk for you when you agree to it. But then when you're faced with having to go do it and route around it and find a show in Pittsburgh on April 1st and like, where am I going to fly into on that Thursday? That's just like a whole, it's just, it's, it's really difficult to, it's not really difficult. That's not fair. It's just, uh, it's overwhelming to be presented with these decisions you made six months previous and then having to go do them. Um, I don't know, man. I hate, I hate like ever complaining about stand up, but I just love the idea of like being like, I loved COVID was great because I couldn't perform. So like, I was like, oh shit, like I'm going to lose my mind. Like, how am I going to do this? And then I was just like home for five months and it was great, you know, like sleeping in the same bed. I, I would, I would venture to guess that I sleep in my home bed less than I sleep in other beds throughout the course of the year. I bet I'm in my home bed 40% of the year compared to 60% of the, you know, like waking up next to my wife is very nice. Going and getting coffee at the place I like in town, like not eating like shit at night, um, you know, being able to make all of our own meals. Like there's just this like this stability that you give up, which is very good when you're starting out in something like you should not be comfortable. You should sacrifice your stability and your safety to get good at something. But now that I've been doing it forever, it's like, shit, when can I just kind of like chill, you know? Yeah, it's it's funny because you said that you would do anything to not have to wake up at a certain time, yeah. and then everything you've just described sounds regimented in a good way. I admire what you and so many other people do in stand up, which is you're on the road forty, fifty weekends a year. You have to be at a certain place to in order to do your job because there are other people that rely on you to do it and the audience bookers agents all these things so you may not have to wake up at a certain time but you you have to be a super disciplined person in terms of being in a place performing doing well and then growing that into something where people will want to continue to see you perform yeah, no, and I mean, like, I don't know. I feel I'm not trying to like act like I'm some fucking warrior poet. The only real discipline I have is getting to the airport in time to get on my flight, and then uh, being at the venue, you know, in time to go on stage. Like, it's just all the downtime in stand up that kills you. It's the mm -hmm. 23 to 22 hours of the day that you have to fill, and hopefully you don't fill it with like gluttony or dependency on substances or uh, anything like that. Um, 
So yeah, man, I don't know. It just it sounds it's just so stupid to ever complain about being a comedian. Mm -hmm. But like if you don't like fill up those hours of the day, something will fill those hours and they can yeah. be very detrimental to your physical and mental health. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about your time in Ithaca, New York. Hell yeah, dude. That seemed like a very wild time to you. And I know we're <laughs> yeah. bouncing around a little bit cuz we were in Denver, you're growing as a stand-up and yeah. from what i understand ithaca was before that period <laughs> could you talk yeah. about that a little bit for sure my best friend growing up clay de he 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 went to school at ithaca college um cornell's in ithaca but he went to ithaca college which was for like townies and stuff very good school don't get me wrong but i remember he went out there and i flew out to I flew out to New York City to meet him New Year's Eve 2005 and we went to Times Square with like our like my backpack on uh, from the airport and we tripped acid in Times Square and that was my first time I've ever been in New York City and it was the most people I'd ever been in and I was totally just like fucked out of my head on very good LSD from upstate New York and I hung out with him for a week and we rented a car even though we were 18 we lied somehow i don't remember how we rented a car and we drove from the city back to ithaca back to, all the way up to like maine down to philadelphia and then back to ithaca and i was like i fucking love it up here this is great and we were in a band together um so i would become kind of disillusioned with college and I think that following summer of 2006, and this is something that I've like been trying to like figure out the actual time frame. 2006, so I'm 19. I moved up there for the summer, hung out with him. Our band toured. Our band, we wrote a bunch of songs. We wrote like 16, 20 songs. Recorded an album over the course of like three months, and then it was time to go back to school in Denver. So I went back to school and I was like, this sucks. So then over the next like two to three years, I would be in school, I would hate it, I would drop out, I'd move up to Ithaca, we would tour, we would write songs. And I would just like live. And we lived in this anarchist commune called Goblin House. And they had an old like meat locker in the backyard, uh, an abattoir. And we would throw shows in there and we would practice in there. And we were just like very much ingrained in like the, you know, very leftist our band was called red versus black because we were like self-styled like you know hypocritical young anarchists uh and we dumpstered food and you know we uh we fell in love every night with a with a new person and it was just a really like magical time uh that i don't remember very much due to all of the uh hallucinogenic drug use but yeah, it was it was special, dude. And I'm I'm actually going back to Ithaca next year. I'm going. I'm performing. I'm returning to Ithaca for the first time in like shit ten years. Clay graduated in 2010, 2011. So yeah, I'm going back for the first time uh, to do stand up, and that's gonna be bizarre, dude. <laughs> Are you gonna reach out to any buddies from the anarchist commune see if they're still there? So the guy who ran, I mean, I, I, I was, I was kept abreast of the going is on up there, but, uh, the guy who ran it, his name was Bob Wolf Young too. So his name was Bob Wolf. That was his first legal first name, Bob Wolf. And his last name was Young two J U N G with the number two. And he like Not changed the second, it to that number two. <laughs> no, no. The number, the numeric two was legally part of his last name. And I, I, he right. came out to a show I did in Austin. He moved down there. I mean, that whole thing fell apart. Um, and it was really weird because like I was living in this anarchist commune with Clay. And then we would go into town and like hang out with his school friends. And then the lead singer of our band went to Cornell, you know, the Ivy League uh, school up there. So like I was living in the woods with anarchists, killing our own chickens, making our own mead. Uh, and then I would go hang out with like all these like kind of like towny kids who wanted to drink like bombers of yingling. And then I would go over and, uh, you know, like play the uh, LGBT community center at Cornell. So I just had this like crazy fucking Venn diagram of influences. And I was, I'm from small town Colorado, man. So to like go up there and like meet kids from France and to like 
you know, fucking smoke weed with Asian kids or like, you know, go to like fucking like Jewish dinners. Like I had my fucking doors blown off by just the mm. scope of, uh, of, of young, like exciting, interesting people that I got to hang out with. And God damn, was it, oh, uh, it, it was, it was cool, man. <laughs> I'm getting all sentimental about it. Yeah. No, it's, it sounds like a wild time. Were you, were you drawn to the anarchist commune because of the anarchy ideology or is it more you just wanted a place to crash also it was an an <laughs> it was an anarchist commune so you were like i guess i'm an anarchist oh, now man. no no man i mean my dad uh my dad get my mom was at kent state when everyone got shot so she she did not fucking like oh, wow. the police and then uh, my dad gave me like a people's history by howard zinn when i turned it was my 16th or 17th birthday so i was like fairly uh, radicalized at that point as much as a you know a kid whose college was paid for can be anti-capitalist you know like there's just it's just fraught with uh it's just fraught with hypocrisy but i think that clay clay was up there earlier and he was hanging out and playing shows with all these like wild far out uh anarchist people and when a room came open at goblin house we lived in a closet together like literally a closet um, cause we like, didn't have any possessions besides our band gear. And they were like, you can pay like 200 bucks a month to live here. And you guys can practice in the abattoir whenever you want, like 24 seven. So I think that had a lot more to do with, uh, why we mm. wound up there as opposed to like us being like, we have to live, like, you know, we have to live in praxis and like be on the front lines of this at all times. I mean, we marched in Syracuse, we marched in Buffalo, we marched in New York City, we fucking threw bricks through Starbucks windows, you know, and that's great because the CEO of Starbucks definitely flies in to clean that up. It's not some other fucking hardworking person who has to go out there with the broom and walk on glass. Yeah. Um, I mean, there was a, we played a show in Lansing one time. And like I said, like the lead singer was this kid named Willie who, um, you know, definitely like came from money but no one no one is asked to be born into their financial circumstances whether it's rich or poor but uh we were playing a show in lansing at an anarchist commune because we would only play all ages venues so like a lot of that was like warehouses mm. houses basements that kind of thing and they were like hey can we do like a little q a after the show and people are like hey so like where do you guys like ideology, ideology, ideologically like line up, you know? And like Willie was like, oh, I'm like a Bakuninist, you know? And like Clay was like, I like Trotsky, like the proletariat must always be right. And then they were like, Sam, what are you? And I was like, I'm selling t shirts and CDs. Uh, they're 20 bucks because that gas does not, uh, the, the van doesn't run on ideals, you know? So like, yeah. that's what I am. <laughs> we can sit in here and pretend to be like, you know, on the, the fucking front lines or on the cutting edge of like, you know, emancipating people from like the gears of, uh, of wage labor, but also like, please buy our fucking merch. Cause we have to get to Cleveland still. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I need to learn more about what anarchism actually is and what people want in their ideal anarchist society. Cause to me, I was never part of a situation like that. So it was just a symbol. Like I would occasionally see, someone with a t-shirt or wallet or something walking around Richmond, Virginia when I was in college and I, oh, I yeah. would look it up and I was be like, Oh, that's, I guess that's the anarchy symbol, but it's, it's basically anti government establishment, anti, I uh, mean, the, 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 a with the circle around it that you see on patches, like, you know, on like, yeah, the, yeah that's what I'm talking sell about. It hot topic. Uh, the way that I understand it, it's no state, it's no hierarchy, it's a leaderless society, it's autonomous groups of like-minded individuals deciding to work together to uh, further common goals. And uh, obviously you can't really have that uh, in the current world we live in, which is why like finding community within the places you live and the, uh, the hobbies you have is so important because you can kind of liberate yourself. Uh, outside of like the needs of money uh, and that kind of stuff if you have a community around you. But, you know, like I think when people think anarchy, they think, uh, you know, blood in the streets, only the strong survive, uh, that kind of thing, you know, like no water, no roads, just like people standing around like flaming uh, trash barrels 
Like that's kind of what yeah. people envision. They, I think they think of like the road by Cormac McCarthy when they think yeah. of like an anarchist or, state. or the Joker saying, "Let's introduce a little anarchy." Right. Yeah. 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 And I think that's. I mean, he was. He was. It, the, the, the synonym of an, anarchy and chaos is. Uh, is very much uh, been an impediment to people like taking the idea, the the, the the political ideal seriously, but the other way I always understood it was just like you know people who specifically it's really hard when people have to work for money uh, because money creates a system of quote unquote slavery where you know you have to trade forty hours of your life every week in order to survive, and I think that if you kind of examine that from a little further away. Uh, you realize how fucked that actually is. Um, mm. So, yeah, I just think that uh, the, we would just be like, hey, we're going to like, you know, <sighs> we're going to have a food bank and we're going to give food to people who can't afford it and we're going to dumpster that food and we're going to teach people how to fix their bicycles and we're going to uh, teach people how to take care of each other and just create these like networks of like radical empathy and uh, from that, hopefully, like some kind of like richer society can grow that isn't just obsessed with like you know going to work for eight hours, coming home tired, eating trash, going to bed. Like there's there's a bigger life that we can all leave live if we like work together to try and make it such. But uh, again, yeah. you know, I'm it's hard for me to talk about this when I'm also plugging my dates. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, come no, see me at Zany's in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> Tickets are thirty dollars. I'm sorry, I don't get to set the own ticket price. You know, yeah, that like th those are the questions I would have for a full fledged anarchist today. Someone who is by the book, following principles or trying to enact certain anarchist principles. Like, how do you, how do you make money doing what you view as your purpose? How do ro roads get built? Like all the things that. The government. Well, is... so so the the thing is, is yeah. like it, it it wouldn't you wouldn't have these mega cities, you know, like uh, the commune is a great like uh, example of how it can work because if you can hypothetically people take they pool their assets and they buy a plot of land. If you have well water on there, the only real connection you need to have to any kind of like greater government is you know your electricity. Uh, so it's just it's. Uh, you couldn't you couldn't have this like free state of people who uh, don't have any leaders or masters and try and run the city of Detroit, you know, but you could mm -hmm. have like, you know, a thousand people living in the woods together or, uh, you know, taking over a city block in Detroit and trying to create this like autonomous zone where uh, capital is not the deciding factor on how people get to live their lives. Yeah, yeah, it seems like we've with all the cities we have now, like just simple things and again, I've, you know, I'm just going off of the most basic version of what I know anarchy to be and what you're telling me. It's it sounds like having cities that already exist and doing things like making sure the water is purified or buildings are built to the point where they're not going to collapse on people. It's it it that seems serves like the common good, you know, like that would be like a very high priority for everyone who lives in that society, you know? So like, but what if, if it's if not you your building? Purify, what, like what, it, what, what is if your you, building? Cause there's no ownership. Like the there's whole no city ownership is like, in, in, in anarchist society. You, so you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, one of the tenets of, uh, of this kind of like thinking is like, you know, property is theft. Like everything should be common, uh, ownership. Um, you know, obviously if you have a bicycle that you've worked on, you should be able to ride your bicycle when you need it. But, you know, like the factories would be owned by the workers. Um, money wouldn't be like the main goal. There'd be like these syndicates of like, you know, Toledo and, uh, Detroit, uh, would work together because Toledo produces grain and Detroit produces, uh, you know, tomatoes and there would be open trade between the two and they would all be, uh, you know, mutually beneficial. It's all about mutual beneficial. Um, yeah. So yeah, like, and you know, if you, if your fucking neighbor's house is on fire, you should help your neighbor get out of that house. Mm -hmm. You know, like they should, you yeah. should open up your doors to people. And at the end of the day, you should share what you have, you know, because you know what it feels like not to have something. And if you have empathy and you are humane, knowing that someone next door to you doesn't have something that you do, you should probably share with them because you understand what it's like to be without, you know? Yeah.
in in a world where people valued being kind and paying attention where everybody did that seems like it would have a chance to work out but it's the biggest threat to a situation like that seems like a powerful few working their way to the top and taking advantage of people's goodwill and then directing resources there's no top di- 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 directing resources to funnel it away from people towards somewhere else and yeah you're always I'm gonna not sure. have greedy you're always yeah. gonna have avarice for sure yeah I'm, you know? I'm not sure what that would look like today but i'm reading about the ukrainian starvation right now the holodomor back in the 1930s and mm-hmm. there was a similar style of no one owns anything in ukraine the soviet union just went around to all the ukrainian farmers and they would ask them voluntarily do you want to join the collective farm and most of these farmers would hold out and then they would start to impose these sanctions on them where as part of the commune or the commune wasn't the word there i forget what the ukrainian word was for it but it's i'll just use the word commune as part of the the commune that they're in they owe a certain amount of grain or produce towards the the village that they're in that will contribute towards feeding everyone and they would adjust the the amount that these farmers had to contribute they would basically spike Mm -hmm. it through the roof to get them to join the collective and so they would basically take all of their grain you, you like force them to force their hand to join the collective farm and then once yeah, the, everyone cons- was part of the collective communism. farm, yeah. Then, then yeah. when everyone was forced to join the farm, then that's when more shit started to hit the fan, where they were being starved out intentionally. And it's not; it, it doesn't sound like it's exactly the same as anarchism. But I would be worried about something like that, where a greedy few, a powerful few, would take advantage of people's willingness to actually be a collective that values the greater good, and then. Yeah, but who's at fault in this situation that you're describing is the state, you know, Mm -hmm. like the people who were in power that were, uh, you know, enforcing this, uh, this wheat tithe, that's the state, you know? So in this stateless society that we're describing where there is no hierarchy and it's just, you know, people following the leader and the leader is no one, uh, it's a lot easier. And again, like you have to like discuss this as like the ideal situation, Um, but yeah, like if someone was trying to, uh, you know, impose their will, um, it was trying to exploit, uh, the, the, you know, the common sympathies that the people who decide to live in this stateless state, uh, you know, they would be cast out. They'd be ostracized. There's no room for that, you know? Um, because like the defense of the common goal, the common shared, uh, need for safety, is shared by everyone. So in that way, if there was a, you know, uh, a greedy uh, party who was trying to come in and exploit them, it serves everyone's needs to stop that from happening. You know what I mean? Yeah, I guess the limit is what's the number of people that could live in a society like that where a natural hierarchy wouldn't start to form? Like, could you have a million people live in an anarchist style would that burn out at a thousand oh, people like like at which i don't think so yeah like it, it seems like the, if you put millions of people are... together that there's always going to be some sort of organizational hierarchy where people try to get power over other people and oh sure at some point um, it would be impossible to prevent that yeah and again i think that uh this whole thing this whole precedent is uh is that it would have to be it's smaller syndicates of people um, you know, I'm talking like town to town, uh, and also like, uh, I don't think that anyone, including myself would say that you could keep order among a million people, but given the alternative that we have, which is mass poverty and, uh, you know, a massive population of the global South being without clean water or food, I think that, uh, capitalism which, uh, you know, states that resources uh, have to be allocated 
based on who can afford those resources, that has not proven to be beneficial for the majority of humankind, you know? So it's like, I think that a radical experiment, like trying to just serve the common goals of as many people as possible, that's a, it's more of a thought experiment than anything, but I think given the alternative, it could be, because I mean, what you're describing is what we live under currently, you know? We're talking about an oligarchy of rich people who run the country and this like, you know, phantom society and this like false belief in the two party system that, uh, they care at all about the constituents that they, uh, falsely represent. Like that whole puppet shows over the charade is done. The emperor has no clothes. And I think we all know that. So like this, I don't, I don't understand like what is so different about what you described going on in the Ukraine as is what's going on in America now, besides the fact that like we have DoorDash, you know? Well, like, in the in the Hall of the Moor, th there would be searches through houses to see if people were hoarding extra grain, yeah. even if they purchased them through their own means. People would have family heirlooms passed down. They would be hiding golden medallions in their walls just because officers would come through the villages and then strip all the possessions away from every single person. Mm -hmm. And they would actually keep tabs on things like who was burning wood they would watch chimneys and say okay that person has food they're cooking food let's go in let's take their shit and yeah. let's kill them i would say no question in just talking about america no question that there's extreme problems with poverty that capitalism is nowhere near perfect that we need to evolve beyond the form of capitalism that came about within the past century or so in order for more people to have a fair shot but no one at least not right now is gonna come into your home if you purchase something with your own means and then kill you because you had a loaf of bread or something like that or oh for make, sure but i yeah. think that in this equivalency that you're drawing where uh grain or whatever uh they were demanding from people was the currency effectively you know uh the IRS is still very much capable of coming in and impeding your ability to have the currency that you've earned. Um, and I mean, I don't know if that's a false equivalency that I'm drawing, but I feel like uh, what you're describing is like that was the unit of measure that people had in order to further their means. That was like a form of wealth was to have grain or salt or sugar, whatever has been exploited out of countless people across the globe for generation since those that are in power make the rules, um, I think there's still like plenty of opportunity for people's freedom and liberty to be impeded by the government. Even if they aren't coming into your house, they can still freeze your bank account. They can still, uh, you know, check your fucking Venmo transactions to make sure everyone's getting their piece of it. And then when you pay that 30% of taxes or whatever it might be, depending on your tax bracket, there's no proof of that money going anywhere to help anyone. You know, like, sure, it's supposed to go to roads and bridges and schools and stuff. But for the most part, most of that cream is just scraped off the top by those in charge. And the people who pay those people to uh, make the legislation that they make, you know, whether it be the corporations that own the politicians that uh, we so ardently uh, back and fight for. It's all just it's all just fucking fake, man. Um, and there's no proof of any kind of like empathy or sympathy being on display in the political system that we have now. Yeah, yeah, the the corporations no doubt have a stranglehold on all the decisions at the top that get made from, you know, politicians all the way down and that affect people's lives and things like Venmo, uh, currency transactions like Bitcoin has been a push against that to take control over your own earnings and currency and have something that's outside this, this centralized system. And in, in that comparison, I would say that being in the worst parts of a capitalist society on average versus being in the worst parts of a Ukraine in the 1930s on average the worst parts of the capitalist society, even though it's nowhere near perfect, is still much preferable to a death penalty for, you know, hoarding 
a piece of bread in your house or, you know, having a hidden gold medallion, not if you don't pay your taxes, you don't get the death penalty in a capitalist society. But in Ukraine, if you didn't pay the tax on grain or you didn't pay the tax on what you're supposed to give to the community, there was the death penalty for that. And they didn't really need a reason. They could just blame it on something else. And I'm not saying right, that- but I don't that, think that, that was that, capitalism though. I don't think what you're describing is a capitalist system. So I think it's like a false equivalency. What do you mean? The Well, what you're describing, I think is, is, is state- uh, conscripted communism, where people the state no, no, no. forces I'm a, I'm a, a commune in in the Ukraine in 1930s, and they say that in order to serve Mother Ukraine, you have to produce enough wheat so we can make the bread that serves Europe. You know, yeah, no, I'm ta I'm talking about capitalism in America versus the the commune, the communism in Ukraine. Oh, I'm sure. saying the, wor the yeah, worst yeah. part of the capitalist society in America is still much preferable to the worst part of the communist uh, society in 1930s Ukraine because the extremes were much more horrific and deadly, even though there are problems in both, there's just an extra sort of, there's an extra darkness to being executed in your garden for not paying your taxes versus having your bank account stripped from you from the IRS if they take everything. S still sucks, still could lead to yeah. people committing suicide, still, you know, your livelihood is your life. You have to make money to survive. But there's just a, just an element of total depravity in the starvation situation in Ukraine that I don't see in capitalist society today. Yeah. I mean, and I agree wanna, with you. If, I, I agree. I agree that we need to improve upon it for sure. If you want to live in a world of extremes, it's very easy to say the worst thing that happened to someone when they were being pulled out of their house and shot in the head for hoarding a loaf of bread that is very bad consumed uh, compared to uh, most of modern life. But if you if you look at like, for instance, like, you know, the state sponsored capitalism of Brazil, where you have the favelas, there's a giant population of the global poor who are living in filth and drinking poison water and not being able to eat. And if that is, you know, the majority of people in some places, I think it's very hard to make the argument that uh, the extremes of communism are worse than the, you know, day in the life of a lot of people just existing in capitalism, you know, like uh, having no dignity, uh, not being able to uh, feel any kind of safety or anything like that, being exploited uh, constantly. Yeah, it might be better than getting shot in the head for a loaf of bread. But when it's the majority compared to the extreme, that's kind of a hard argument to make. You know what I mean? Well, the the I I should have phrased it differently. Not the extreme of Ukraine in 1930s. That was the norm because it happened to seven million people. Like they were just going around to everyone and doing that. And I'm I'm not saying that you know obviously seven million is a lot, but I mean, how yeah. many billions of people in the in the globe right now don't know when they're going to eat next? You know what I mean? A ton, a yeah. ton, billions, billions. Right. So there's billions global that like don't have any, you know, sense of security. Um, that's, 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 that's a lot of people compared to that, the atrocities of Ukraine in the 1930s for sure. You know? Yeah. It's horrible. I, I think both are terrible for me. And, and I think uh, we, I think we both agree that both are terrible. Yes. Both are terrible. Yes. But for <laughs> yeah. me, there's just from what I'm reading based on Moran Delo, his account of living through the Ukrainian starvation, there just seems like the, the, the actual act of someone coming in and searching your home and doing it on a widespread basis or is happening to all your neighbors and all the communities and your whole country, like the physical infiltration of someone coming in and killing you I, I I don't know if I, I'm not well, saying it's bad. I'm not, I'm, homes, I'm not though. saying it, I'm not saying it's worse or better than anything. Yeah. I'm just saying, for me, I would rather take my chances in a society that was not that, whatever it is. 
Yeah. I just, I think that I think a lot of the people who uh, are living outside and uh, burning tires for warmth might argue that it would be a godsend to have a home for the government to come search. You know what I mean? Uh, or to even like have any kind of like, just any kind of shelter. They'd be like, yeah, you know, it sucks if I'm hoarding bread, but uh, at least I like live indoors, you know? And there's a lot of people who like don't have that because they're being crushed in the gears of capitalism uh, day by day, generationally by generation. Yeah. Any system of government that we've had throughout human civilization has a body count and it's tragic and it's terrible. And Well, yeah. It, I mean, like representative it's, it's, democracy it's is pretty sick. Yeah. And there's a lot of that that like, you know, would definitely be used in some kind of stateless society where there'd be direct voting and uh, people could, you know, make decisions based on what served the greatest number. And if people would disagree with what the decision was made and these, they could, you know, secede and go and build their own societies based on their common goals. You know, there's nothing like keeping them uh, inside the borders of that place um, mm. that might not like they don't agree with it uh, intrinsically, you know. How would I hold up in the anarchist commune? Is is my be conversation level wood. good enough to, you know, shoot the shit and talk about capitalism versus anarchism? Uh, I mean, I don't know, dude. I think that if we were living in a society where like, you know, I think that you would be, you'd be great, man. You know, if you're community minded and you're willing to work, uh, and then, you know, at the end of the day, that's the cool thing is once the work's done, then it's time to feast, then it's time to get out the guitars, then it's time to share stories. Um, all that stuff that like, we kind of forget about because we're on our phones looking at, uh, people do crowd work. Uh, it, it's just like, there's just like such a bigger, fuller life out there that's been uh, kind of eschewed for modern comfort and convenience, mm. you know? And I'm saying that as a guy who like, you know, loves owning books and uh, likes comfortable shoes. Like again, and I'll say it for like the fourth or fifth time, there's a bunch of hypocrisy involved in any kind of idealistic conversation, you know? So like, um, I, I get that a lot of this is pie in the sky, uh, but still it's good. It's nice to have the idea of a big pie in the sky instead of uh, a big brown cloud of uh, carcinogenic chemicals that are blocking out the sun in certain parts of the world. Yeah, uh, that does not sound like a, a cloud that I would like to uh, be in or around carcinogenic clouds. Yeah, I, can I mean, say... the rivers have run dry. I travel this country, <laughs> yeah. there's no rivers anymore. You can see the banks of every fucking river you want, dude. It's just like, where's the water going? Oh, there's a water war secretly going on. And people are buying water rights left and right so that they can have water because they know that that's what's coming. That's what's next, you know? So it's like, if it is just like seeing this country firsthand and talking to the people as I do every weekend, like there's just this like kind of like sense of doom and gloom. It's so pervasive. Traveling the past 15 years or so, you've been able to see actual physical changes in the environment, like riverbanks, just oh, yeah. th things that look different than they did back in 2007. Yeah, the reservoirs are, that. are almost gone, you know, like uh, even where I live in Fort Collins, like the Poudre River, it's a, it's a fucking shadow of its former self, um, you know, Horsetooth Reservoir, it's barely full enough for boating anymore, you know. That is the cool thing about traveling, though, and meeting people is like, I think that America is very uh, problematic and it's fraught with uh, a lot of just core issues that are in the marrow of its bones. But I think Americans are cool. Like for the most part, Americans are like very open to, uh, you know, they want to have a conversation with you. A lot of them would open their doors to you. They'll cook you a meal. They'll give you a ride. You know, if they have two beers, they'll give you one. I think that Americans are good people and we've just like been totally hosed by uh, <laughs> the system of uh, oligarchical uh, corporations owning this country. Um, but, you know, there's still like barbecues. That's cool. There's still like small victories as far as like living here. We'll always have barbecues. Yeah, we'll always, never, hopefully uh... we'll always have barbecues. I mean, we probably won't because we won't have meat very soon. But, uh, you know, we can fucking roast crickets and hang out and play acoustic guitars. A lot of protein. A lot yeah, of protein for sure. and crickets. Yeah. 
so I, I want to I, I want to get to your book because there there are a few a few um par a uh, few paragraphs that I wanted to go through and ask you about. And I yeah. just want to say again, if you're listening to this, please go fucking buy Running the Light. Yeah, you can buy it, it from is, samtalent.com. Yes. S-A-M-T-A-L-L-E-N-T dot com. And I'll uh, ship you a signed copy out of my house. Perfect. So page 97, there is a part where Billy Ray Schaefer, the protagonist, talks about killing on stage and like what it feels to kill on stage. Yeah. And I wanted to read that. So you write, it was like waking up. For the next 43 minutes, Billy Ray's voice was blood in their veins. Reality cooked away. He was their shepherd. They went where he led. Bewitched, they spoke in tongues. Laughter, the wordless language of purest communication, the unnatural coupling of logic and primality. Billy Ray explored the space, riffing on what he saw. He chewed up the stage like something uncorralled, pushing, pulling, establishing limits before crossing them, swinging seamlessly between bits and riffs in a display of vocal trapeze. The intensity of his focus was fire and brimstone. He commanded attention like a preacher at a pulpit, and the men listened to his words like they might save their souls. Although he wasn't as quick as he was in his prime, his crowd work remained tenacious, rapid fire. All he saw were targets bobbing from one man to the next, weaving in callbacks, opening at high speed in multiple sectors, and expert spinning plates. He made it look he made it look easy because for him it was. That's fucking I, I've never, you know, like I said, never had any experience like that. And when I'm reading it, I'm like, damn, I could feel just a glimpse of what it's like to fucking kill on stage. Like the the way that you pay attention to every detail the the sweat the the flow of what he's saying the the look in people's eyes in the crowds it's 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 insane the the level of how you and capture people into the words thanks man that's uh yeah it's crazy when people like read me parts of the book and i'm like how the fuck did i write that what the hell <laughs> and, yeah, that sounds pretty solid i mean i bet you experienced that flow state though you know, like when you're placing the ball right over the plate, wherever you need it to be, you know, we've all like locked into certain things perfectly and, uh, existed from heartbeat to heartbeat inside of that thing, you know? But yeah, man, that's, uh, that's not bad. If, I mean, if I, if I was a person listening to this, I might want to buy that book. I'll say that. I would, I, I would <laughs> want to buy that book and I would buy that book. <laughs> Thanks, man. That's very so, kind. It, is there anything that, compares to the showbiz like like is that the ultimate high in showbiz or anything like what compares to killing on stage i don't know man i think if you asked me that question five or ten years ago i'd say nothing i'd say it's the definitive experience uh but i think after doing something for long enough and uh you know becoming you know good at it I mean, it's pretty hard to argue with like drinking a real nice glass of wine next to, uh, you know, a river uh, in, in there's there's, you know, fucking watching the sun down over. I think that my issue is I'm such a romantic and essentialist that uh, there's certain aspects of. Um, I don't know, dude, I feel like it's uh, it's 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 an exchange based situation. Uh, you are funny and they laugh. And if you're doing it correctly and they're laughing a lot, then you're just exhibiting like uh, mastery of your craft or, uh, you know, just the hours you put into it the same way that someone could like build a house out of bricks and be like, look at this, this fucking rules. But I will say that there's like very few things that compare to uh, having a really good fucking set <laughs> for sure. Yeah. You know, see that to me is beyond the flow state of pitching a baseball because baseball and, and pitching to a catcher specifically has that level of undeniability where if you throw a pitch 93 miles an hour that crosses the black, it is objectively a strike. There, even if the, you know, the umpire is there to call it, but there's no exchange where the hitter goes like, I don't think that was a strike. It's still a fucking strike. When you're going back and stand forth. I think with stand-up, it's like that too, you, though. It's like, it's just objectively funny. You know, and there's not even any rooms for like symbols when it comes to stand up. It's either good or it's bad. That's why I don't think stand up's an art. I think it's a craft because like art's open for interpretation. Um, so I don't know, man. 
I think that like stand up is like objectively good or bad, you know, like they either laugh or they don't. And that's kind of like the binary beauty of it. What, like what, what if you're in a, you just know you have a shitty audience. Like what if you're saying something you deep down know is objectively funny to you, but for whatever reason, it's just not hitting that audience specifically. Like if I threw a strike in Boise, Idaho, it's a yeah. strike in New York city. Right. But like it, just the subjective versus the objective how do you how do you come to the conclusion if it's that it's objective if there's so much subjectivity from the crowd oh no i think that i mean i totally understand what you're saying i don't think that night by night it's uh you can say this is good or this is bad you can't go up on stage with 60 minutes of stuff and say all of this is good but in that moment it is objectively good or bad because they laugh or they don't. You know what I mean? Like, mm. um, I don't, and that's the beauty of stand up is like you can be the fucking best in the world at it. And then you go and you do a show for some people who aren't feeling you. And guess what? You're not the best in the world at that moment. You are bad. You can be a fucking 35 year, 40 year, 50 year veteran of stand up and have killed all over the world. And then you have one show in that moment, everyone's going to leave there and they're going to say, this guy's not good. Oh, I saw him. He was not good. I saw her. She sucked. And that's the beauty of it. You have to earn it every fucking time, mm. you know? And I think that's like pretty pure in a way. And I like that about stand up. Yeah. And I identify with how adversarial Billy Ray Schaefer is with his audience in the book. Cause he says at one yeah. point, I'm, I want to kill you. Or like, I, I, yeah. uh, I'm trying to kill you. I want to be the and, only voice in the world. Yeah. And that is, the the essence of competition is that only one person can walk away there's a winner or a loser and in billy ray's case he's gonna be the winner yeah he'll do anything to fucking beat the audience so how do you how do you view the audience because you seem much less adversarial in your stand-up I'm grateful they're there i serve them dude you know i don't take what i do on stage that seriously i want everyone to laugh I'm not trying to get up there and like prove that I'm smart or that I, you know, uh, that I, I think a lot of comics want to like self style themselves as like philosophers and truth tellers. And it's like, no, I just want everyone to fucking choke on their vomit from laughing, you know? And if that means being silly, if that means, uh, laying prostrate to them and showing my belly so they can feel like they're the alpha in the room, like that's fine with me as long as they leave and have a good time. And I'm just super grateful for anyone who comes to a show. You know, I think it's probably cooler to say, no, I'm the best and they're lucky to have me. But no, there's there's no me without the people who are there to witness it. I don't think that's cooler. I mean, maybe in pro wrestling, if you were playing a character or something, but behind the scenes, you were a good guy. Right. But in, in stand up, it's intertwined like the you know, there's a lot of elements of a person's personality on stage. And it seems like that crosses over more like you're, it's not. uh what do they call it? Fabe, fabe something in wrestling where it's like you maintain the character. Oh, kayfabe? Kayfabe, yeah. yeah. Like is that, do you, do you run into comedians like that that are just like in kayfabe mode where they're keeping the character going but then if you catch them off stage they're just totally not the same vibe? Oh yeah, I think that everyone is uh, building their clown as I think Mark Marin calls it. And, uh, you know, that clown is heightened and hyperbolic versions of yourself and pieces of yourself that you kind of like, you know, blow up or, uh, or pull back on to, uh, to be communicate stuff funny. But, uh, yeah, I think that there's also just like specifically like, you know, like New York comedians, Boston comedians, there's a swagger to what they do. And there's like a, Hey, shut the fuck up and listen to me. Cause I'm the best. And, uh, and I think that's like, that's like kind of like a cool thing, you know, <laughs> like to have that confidence as fake as it may be. Uh, I'd rather, I'd rather go on stage with like an infallibility where I'm like, Hey, I'm the best instead of like being like me where I'm pacing for 30 minutes before every show, you know, like the nerves have never gone away from me. And, uh, I feel like there's some people who are better at the very least of hiding the fact that they are not secure in, uh, in this very difficult thing, which is making people laugh consistently. Do you ever try to say it out loud? Something like I'm the best or I'm going to fucking kill <laughs> before yeah, you go on stage. stage. 
no, 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 no like it's before, always when even I if you don't off. believe it, like even if you're pacing, <laughs> even if you're sweating like a pig, pacing back and forth, saying like, oh, I'm the best. I th like, do you ever just try saying it to see if it changes yeah. your mindset? There was a period where before I would go on stage, I would, I read something about primate posture and how if you like walk with your hands up, it kind of gets back to your monkey brain where it was like when we were primates and we had to scare other primates by looking big. Uh, so yeah, like I tried that for a bit and then you're just walking around in front of a bar in Columbia, Missouri with your hands held high trying to imitate an ape. But I'll get off stage after a good set and I'll fucking walk in the green room and, you know, I'll say to my friends or the, the host or the feature, be like, that's how it's done. <laughs> Take mm. notes, you know? <laughs> Fuck yeah. It, yeah, but I mean, that's, I mean, my friends. That's like the stand-up comedy version of pimping a home run. Exactly, like you get dude. off stage and you're like, yeah. here, hold my dick. Yeah, for sure, dude. Yeah, that's, uh, it's flicking the bat, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's doing the slow trot. And my friends would always, uh, I mean, luckily, I feel like I'm a good friend and I'm generous because thank God, because back in the day when I would get off stage, I'd be like, oh, fuck yeah, I'm the best. And they'd be like, shut up. And it's like, well, who was better? Yeah. Who was better tonight? I was the best. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So, yeah, dude, that's that's one of the uglier parts of <laughs> of myself, for sure. I don't I don't think that's ugly. I, th I think... <laughs> That's a, that's a natural thing when you know that you've performed something to yeah. the best of your ability or the best you, you could possibly do it, in though. that moment. <laughs> you should always try and maintain some humility, I think. <laughs> well, you you don't have to say it out loud. Some right. people do. I yeah. mean, I just love that type of shit and I would even respect it. You know, there there was there were a couple times where I gave up 500 foot home runs in college like I, I gave up a good, good number of home runs in college where you could put together a highlight reel over five years but like there <laughs> yeah. are a couple that stand out where I was throwing to a guy who later was the third pick overall in the draft and I was just like this guy is so fucking good but fuck yeah. it I'm just gonna throw fast like see what happens and the ball made contact with the bat and I just knew it was going 500 fucking feet. Like it was like he drove it instead of hit it. It was like a backspin golf swing where it just kept getting higher and higher and higher. I'm like, Jesus yeah. Christ, this ball is not going to fucking land. And it was pimped and it was, you know, he had this swagger running around the bases and there was nothing I could do, but just think I got boned and <laughs> I have to, I have to throw the next pitch. And earlier, my that was I, I think that was my senior year, um, but earlier in my career, I would have fucking like been like fuck this guy, like I've got super angry, tense to the point where it would have hurt my pitching after that. But having four years of college baseball before that, I just thought like I got boned. Yeah, that dude's fucking amazing. I still have to throw the next pitch and yeah. fuck it. Like I wasn't thinking I was the best in that moment for sure but there was this element of whatever fuck it i got fucked now i'll still right, try to and fuck I've the been next here guy before yeah i know this isn't going to end my life i know this feels bad in this moment but it's going to be one that's the thing is like i always forget the worst shows but i remember the good ones you know and like i was in atlanta two weeks ago and i was at the club and it's uh the first show on friday and my friend, my friend Nathan Lund, who's the co-host to my podcast, Chubby Behemoth, he goes out there and he bombs. They hate him. And like the host, they hated the host, you know. Uh, and I was watching Lund and it, there's nothing funnier than uh, watching your friend who you know to be funny bomb. Because you're like, I've seen these jokes. They're good. I know that these work. So I was like, okay, well, Lund's having a tough time, but I'll go get him. And then I went up there and I had to repeat Lund's performance for double the amount of time. They fucking hated us, dude. And when I got yeah. off stage, of course, there's the moment of fuck, that sucked. But then within five minutes, we're laughing about it being like, what the hell happened? You know? And it's like, we know it's not the end of the world. It's happened yeah. before. It'll happen again. And that's why you just do something enough that you can kind of like divorce your ego and your own mental well-being from that individual thing but yeah. it hurts you know but what luckily it, the half-life on the pain is getting shorter and shorter yeah what is it that 
makes us find the failure of our friends hilarious in the moment because I have vivid memories of just, <laughs> you know, seeing, you know, John or Jay, like guys I played with give up just fucking mammos. And my instant reaction was just to laugh on the, like I would literally see the ball come off the bat and I would just start laughing. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I'd be like, I don't know why I'm laughing, but it was just so, they get like, it's so fucking rocked. It's just hilarious. And I love them, but it's also funny as fuck. And there's, oh, yeah. I don't know what it is. Like I should, like I don't either. logically I shouldn't laugh at that. Cause I, I, I love that guy. I, I've spent, you know, thousands of hours with that guy you know, he's my teammate, die for that guy. But like yeah. when he gets fucked, it's hilarious. Like, I don't know. I don't That's know. <laughs> so interesting. Cause like, I don't, I don't, I can't draw the comparison to sports. Cause like, I remember, I, maybe I do. Cause I remember watching film and you'd watch film and you know, your offensive line coach is screaming at you because you missed the trap block. And you're like, oh yeah, I, what the fuck? You know, I don't, maybe it's a relief. Maybe it's a sign of Maybe it's, uh, I don't know, your soul exhaling. I don't know, dude. But it is so funny to watch someone you know is good at something fail. <laughs> yeah. I don't, know. I don't know what it is. Maybe we're sick. <laughs> I mean, we're definitely sick. But yeah, th something's there's, wrong. <laughs> there's some, I don't know what it is. There's some trigger that leads to laughing at the failures of the people closest to you for a moment before you go support them and be like, whatever, you'll get them next time. But just like there's, and it's not every time, but some of those failures, it's just an instant, just cackling, holy fuck, what just happened? Oh, and yeah. then you go, you're like, sorry, man, like that was, go get them, you know, get them next time. Yeah. I mean, God. That's so funny. I'm glad to hear that you experienced that thing, <laughs> that same oh, thing. <laughs> yeah, and I've and I've had guys, you know, like the home run I just described. I've had guys laugh at my shit where it's just so obvious that I got just steamrolled for an at bat or an inning, and I come in and I make eye contact with someone, and they just start laughing, and I'm just like, "Fuck!" Like, <laughs> it's it's brutal. I don't know. There's just some like the, it's so brutal that it's funny. Some something uh, absurd. Who knows? <laughs> it is. It, I mean, I I've experienced like <laughs> I remember when my book came out. I was at Stanhope's house with Shane Gillis. We were down there, and uh, Bert Kreischer had me on his podcast but this was like during covid and bert is like very distracted in a hotel room over a zoom like this and he's like answering phone calls and just like while he, he like sets this up he lets us talk and while he's doing that he's like you know this is when he was filming his tv show for tbs and i remember that i told this like amazing story to bert and he's clearly not paying attention and as i'm telling it shane's next to me just poking me in the ribs going, you're bombing. Oh, you're bombing. He's not even listening. He's on his phone. So yeah, those, those are, that's, that's a fun thing to share <laughs> between people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, fuck. I, it's, I, I don't even want to know what it is because maybe if that energy is revealed, the magic trick is over and then I'll never see the hilarity in situations like that again. But so, there's oh, yeah. something there that just incites insane laughter yes. at the failure of friends. Yes. And I'm grateful for those moments. <laughs> yeah, of course. Cause it means you're close to them. You yeah. can't laugh at someone you don't know. Yeah. If a stranger was bombing, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't make fun of him for it. You know, if a, a stranger's bombing, I'm going to tell her like, Hey, good set, you know, but if it's like a close friend of mine, I'm going to be like, oh, what the fuck? Yeah. They hated you. <laughs> yeah. No, if, if a stranger's, if a stranger's bombing, it's like, watching a documentary and seeing something horrible happen you're just like that's yeah. that's sad it's like faces sad. of death yeah because yeah. there's no fraternity there's no kinship no. you don't care about them i think you have to really laugh with someone or at someone you have to care about them i'm sure there's some evolutionary reason for why we laugh at the people we care about maybe there was something i don't know if you're in a tribe and you failed and people laughed at you instead of excommunicated you or called you a piece of shit. Maybe that led to people surviving for longer or something like that. I don't know. Well, yeah, it's we don't know where laughter down. comes from. We have no idea why we laugh, like, evolutionarily. It's very weird. Yeah. Yeah. The, I don't know, I mean, I, I feel like it had to be 
physical comedy because we didn't speak for so long. So it had to be just someone fucking tripping on their face trying to build a fire or something or stack oh, no, some I think, stones. I think we know like what's funny, but like the reason that we laugh at something is totally like there's no leading science on the phenomenon of laughter. Oh, like why like why l- b- opening our mouths and making that sound is their spot like why we don't think something's funny and then start like going like this with our hands instead or why of, we even yeah. think anything's funny yeah like what purpose does it serve to be totally removed from defending yourself momentarily at the drop of a hat like if someone farts and you're like trying to like you know defend yourself against a saber-toothed tiger and you laugh at it like that does like people people who are laughing should have like died off if you're like yeah. an evolution person yeah <laughs> you know well, like you're totally yeah. like just you're 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 indefensible when you're in the throes of laughter. You can't like stop yourself, you know. Yeah, the the benefits of it being a vocal response must have outweighed the cost of it not being a vocal response. Like, I don't know. It, it, it's it's highly audible. You see the change in someone's facial expression. You know, it could have been a butthole sound, but then you wouldn't have the the facial expressions on people change. So maybe it wouldn't be obvious as obvious. But yeah, there has to be some reason for why it's a loud noise. It takes over your entire body when it's true laughter. And it's so weird because you're right. It incapacitates you. Like you, the worst thing to happen in danger would be to just be like seized by uncontrollable laughter yeah, as you're getting stabbed sure. to death because you literally couldn't defend yourself. Like yeah. it's the worst thing in the world to happen to you outside of being tied up, like just laughing uncontrollably. There's like some hypothesis that it's like to show like you're like, it's to show that you're like, I don't know. I can't remember what it was. There's something about like showing your teeth. <laughs> to be like i'm smiling you know like my teeth are not being used to like steal your resources or chew on you but it's all fucking hokum no one yeah. knows so norm mcdonald's a major character or yeah. uh, he makes he makes multiple appearances in running the light yeah he it, it seems like he serves as a almost like a bullshit detector for billy ray I don't know. Yeah, I think Anthony, you, Anthony you, Jesselnik called it the wise old sage. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a moment where it's more than a moment. It's four straight pages of Billy Ray having a catharsis dump on stage. Yeah. And there's a moment where Norm is backstage and Billy's featuring for Norm's coming out before and Billy thinks it's shit. And yeah. then Norm says, no, that was good. That was the truth. You know, I mm-hmm. the, don't feel ashamed of, of the truth. And in that moment, I thought, oh, like that is Norm's kind of like this barometer of sorts. Yeah. Like where Billy Ray is in life, he could look at Norm McDonald's reaction and know where he's at is he really fucking up is he going down the wrong path is he going on the right path if he talked to norm there was some sort of settling that went on in his soul or at least he would know where he was at yeah i think norm uh respected people being funny first he's not judgmental and uh he valued um you know he he valued the outsider to a certain degree i don't know dude i just wanted to have someone in that book who connected Billy Ray's past to Billy Ray's present. And I thought that Norm was a good hinge for that. And also having listened to Norm speak for, you know, hundreds of hours on YouTube and and consuming every bit of content he's ever put out, I could write in his voice. And I was really happy that like other comedians said that I did a good job with Norm. Mm -hmm. Like I've become friends with Norm's old podcast co-host, Adam Egot, And I was so nervous about him reading it. And he was like, no, dude, you did an excellent job. And that was like, that's the biggest compliment I've got. Is Adam Egget saying that I wrote Norm correctly? That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I've watched. I, I used to have. I mean, I, I still do. But there was a streak of months and months and months where every time I ate lunch, my entertainment was typing in Norm McDonald to YouTube search and just yeah. going through every single video until oh, I yeah. could find a new one. All the Conan appearances, stand-up clips, anything that had Norm McDonald even appear in it. I would yeah. watch it and he's the goat. Yeah. And and I definitely got that vibe just based on watching those clips and listening to his stand up that it, it felt like something that Norm would say. Well, thanks, man. That's I'm glad to hear that. 
and obviously I, I never got the chance to actually know him. That's just based yeah, off. I never met him YouTube. either. That's based never off the algorithm. Once. Based off the algorithm. Yeah. But it seems like you you hit it spot on. Thank you, dude. Yeah. R.I.P. to the legend. Mm. Yeah. R.I.P. What are the, if there are any ways that you align with Billy Ray Schaefer, what are the things you see in him that are the closest to yourself? Um, uh, probably like the, uh, the gluttony, probably the, uh, the, the need to, uh, have beers before a show, uh, yeah, that's probably it. Just like not being in control of like your pleasure seeking mm. part of you. Um, you know, I'm wholly monogamous to my wife. I've I feel like I'm a good husband and a good son and a good brother and a good friend. So I don't like share those. But uh, you know, I've definitely had too many Miller lights like after a show or that kind of thing for sure. I'm not a cocaine guy. People think I'm like a fucking you know, recovering cocaine addict because of his love, his lust for cocaine in the book. But that was never you, my thing. Because you, de- you describe the the cocaine scenes in the book with the wisdom of a recovering cocaine addict. <laughs> Thanks, man. That's another nice thing to say. Yeah, Marin was like, so yeah, you're just, how, how, how long are you clean or are you clean? And I was like, oh, I just, I mean, I've done cocaine, but like I've, n- I've never done stand-up on cocaine ever in my life. I bet it's performance enhancing. I bet it rules. Yeah, I've heard Joey Diaz talk about it on his podcast, and he said it sucks your soul out or something along those yeah. lines. Like he did it a few times and then stopped, and he would do it after. Well, it's probably like having sex on Molly. It's like here's something that's like really pleasurable, and then you heighten it with this like chemical, and it's like, well, how do you ever do it again without that chemical? Yeah, yeah. I mean, cocaine, Adderall, those things in general. They- you know, I've I've heard other people say that it has this effect and it's definitely had this effect on me when I've been on it. Like everything you say is genius beyond, right, yeah. beyond the drinking, like drinking definitely lowers your inhibitions, raises the ego, but drinking and cocaine is another level where you're just fucking like you're mentally jacking yourself off. Like you're yeah. having, con- you're con- having conversations in your head to the point yes. where you're not even speaking anymore. You're just like thinking about how good your thoughts are. And you're like, I haven't said anything for 20 minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've just been writing business notes in my iPhone to like call Steve yeah. jobs tomorrow. <laughs> it's always time to talk and not time to listen when you're uh, on cocaine. <laughs> yeah. And when you're listening, you're just listening to your own thoughts. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so when you're sorry, I'm all gassy. I ate a bunch of yogurt and beans for lunch, so I keep trying to burp off of the microphone. <laughs> oh no, that's uh, just press the burp button underneath your desk. I put, I put yeah, one there just every time you have to it. burp. Yeah. <laughs> when you're writing those scenes, like an extended hangover scene or extended cocaine scene, in running the light are you writing it free form free of like uh what do you call it like f- uh consciousness flow just like kind of thinking of it imagining it in your head and then just writing as it comes out and this is what i imagine if i recorded someone doing blow in a hotel room in boise idaho that had the personality of billy ray schaefer this is how it would do it or is it more is it more uh, like structurally thought out from the beginning, like free flow versus these are the elements of a cocaine binge and I have to put these elements together? I think writing those parts of the book were fun because it was just like you can create this monster and uh, think of new synonyms for fucked up, you know? <laughs> like, uh, I, I, the way I write is weird. Like I try, I, I write, I start the day writing by editing what I wrote the day previous. So like by the time I get to the end of the first draft, it's been pretty well manicured at that point. Um, so yeah, no, I definitely, I'm not good at being like today I will write this. It's more like, okay, I think I know where this scene ends. So I'm just going to like try and get there. And uh, yeah, no, I, I definitely didn't like pre plan too much of the book. Um and also, like, I'm not, like, educated in the way to, like, write a book. I just, like, did it. So I don't know if I have, like, 
mm. the best understanding of where it comes from besides being in front of the computer so that I can like create, you know, you can't like write a song unless you're in front of the piano. So I'm in front of the computer so that shit can come out of me. Mm. I'm just going to take a, a piss real quick. I'm about to explode, but I'll, I'll be right back. All right. Yeah. I have to ask you, what is it like being on tour with Tim Dillon? Because I'm a huge Tim Dillon fan uh, as well. Yeah, he's the man. He's super generous. He's uh, incredibly wise as far as like new media. Um, you know, he's helped forge a path for that himself and innovated in that realm. He's also just super funny. He's a great hang. He has great taste in restaurants. Um, you know, like I said, generous with his time and... Um, you know, pays very well. I, I fucking love the guy. I'm really glad to be his buddy. Is there anything you pick up from him stand up wise when you go on before him and then you watch him perform? Is there something, you know, over the months or years you've been working with him that you've felt particularly inspired by from his stand up? Well, it's interesting to see a guy who sells 3,600 tickets in Toronto and then he gets off stage and he just gets on his phone, you know, like it's like nothing happened. So it's like kind of good to see that like even getting to that level of success, it's not the answer, you know, it's like you think that like you reach some certain level and all of a sudden you're just like happy and everything. The man doesn't rest. He's always concerned with like what's next for him, like creatively, like what's going to be on the next podcast. It's just cool to see that work ethic. Um, I think that's probably the most that I've learned from him is like not to like, you know, rest on your laurels or like pat yourself on the back too much. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like, you know, I, I I've always been interested in listening to his podcast, how ideas get formed. Like if he's riffing with the guys he tours with during the week or he's, like, have you ever seen something come to life in conversation or something backstage going out later and then it's on the podcast or is it more just completely separate from the stand up? Um, yeah, I mean, we were on a tour bus for the first three months of that tour and there was a lot of downtime and you'd see him like there'd be like a spark of like something in the news or a tweet that he would read that would end up influencing the next episode. But the closer we got, the more we just like would watch very bad television on Netflix and laugh and smoke cigarettes in his hotel room. I mean, early on in our relationship, I treated it as like he was my boss and I'm, you know, working for him. So I'm here to do a good job and stay out of his way. And then we became very close as you do when you do, you know, fucking three continents with a guy. Uh, so yeah, I mean, of course there's some of that, but it, 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 he got a lot more comfortable being himself around me as did I and uh, just hanging you know hanging out with your friend who happens to be one of the smartest people who's also a once in a generation broadcaster like you know he's not sitting around running bits or being like do you think this is interesting but he will like mm -hmm. have like a nugget of an idea and then um, you know you see that kind of like germinate later that week yeah yeah, go, going back to your special waiting for death to claim us, like I just had to bring up the gun moment, the the gun incident oh, where the yeah. guy had the gun, like that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if, 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 if anything speaks to your connection with the audience, it's almost convincing a guy to give you the gun off his waistband on he stage. He was going to give me the gun. And he be was like, here goes, he yeah. was a cop. Yeah, he, <laughs> was, looked, he was a police officer like from Kentucky. <laughs> He came over the river to Cincinnati with his friends and he was reaching for his gun. And then in the edit that we have, uh, it didn't work. Like you couldn't see it, but you could hear it from a different camera angle where you hear his wife and his friends being like, are you fucking crazy? What are you doing? You know, as he's like yeah. reholstering his pistol. But yeah, if he would have given me that gun, that would have been, that would have been big. That would have been a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like to go from the guy acknowledges that he has a gun on him and then you're just like, yeah, go, can I have your gun? You know? And he's legitimately considering he it. Looks and would around have given a little it, bit. Yeah. <laughs> he considers yeah. it. And then you see him just like fall prey to peer pressure and he reaches for it. And then everyone at his table is like, stop. No, there are other police officers. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, 
I mean, the, the, there are so many hilarious moments in that special, but I've never seen anything like that in another stand-up special. Convincing an audience member to lend you a firearm mid-set <laughs> yeah. is another level of just the hypnosis that goes on between the the audience and the performer that's top notch <laughs> well yeah and he was like pretty cold initially in the set and i like a lot of that set was me trying to like win him over because he was so prominently displayed in front of everyone i was like look at all these people they love it what's the matter with you and i was able to kind of break him like a horse to the point where he was willing to give me his service revolver <laughs> That's a superpower. You know, you're, you're standing in line in a bank and I know people don't rob banks anymore, but if you were alive back in the, you know, the the heyday of John Dillinger, he walked in, yeah. you could just grab a microphone and say like, hey, you know, let me see your gun. Let oh, me, yeah. uh, let that me was a, that. was a big anarchist money making scheme was bank robbing. They loved that all over the world. That was a big thing they were good at. There's something so fucking cool about robbing a bank with the air of a gentleman, like walking in in a pea coat, sure. just looking, just like dressed to the nines, <laughs> with an Uzi. The like in the in the bottom of your heart, you don't want to harm anyone. You're like, I'm stealing from the bank. I'm not stealing from you. Ultimately, people yes. do get hurt. Innocent people do get hurt. <laughs> but just like the swagger of like a John Dillinger, Johnny Depp walking in, just it's. It's uh, it's enticing. It's it's fun to watch. Yeah, dude, for sure. There's a good book about a bank robber called Cherry. Uh, it's really easy to read. It's like a PSD veteran who has an opiate dependency, and he starts robbing banks in Cleveland to further his. They made they made like a bad movie of it, but the book's really fun. Mm. It's mm -hmm. written by the guy who actually did it. He's like in prison. It's a novel, but uh, he wrote it while he was in jail. Nico Walker. It's called Cherry. I'll check it out. Yeah, Cherry. Okay. Super easy to read. Uh, it's good. Nice, nice. So you've traveled uh, 40 weekends a year for the past 10 years, which is something- I mean, probably 45 on average, man. 45 on average for the past decade or so. Yeah. What's something that you've learned about people- that you couldn't have learned if you never did that grind as a stand-up comedian? Have, have you never traveled, never met the people you have, didn't have those experience? What's something you learned about people that you couldn't have outside of stand-up? Um, I mean, like I said earlier, like, they're good. You know, I think people are good inherently. Um, oh, here's – they all have one good joke. Everyone has, like, one banger of a joke. And if they, if they, someone tells you like you want to hear a joke, nine times out of 10, it's, you might've heard it before, but they tell it very well and they're really happy to share it with you. And yeah, if someone wants to tell you a joke, you should like take the time and listen to it because either it's really good and you can tell it to your friends or you can be like, God, that was the worst joke I've ever heard, which is also mm -hmm. valuable. Is there, is there something you've learned about yourself that you couldn't have learned outside of stand up? Like if you kept following the trajectory of music you know, obviously that's an alternate universe, but so something that you could have only learned in the slice of universe that you chose as a stand-up comedian about yourself. Mm, yeah, I guess I have a pretty high barometer. I, I can take a punishment pretty easy, whether it be like sleeping on a floor or like, uh, you know, not knowing if I have any money for until Thursday when I have a gig where I make a hundred bucks. I'm pretty fucking resilient and uh, pretty crafty as far as like mm. solving or like finding solutions to like you know keeping my person alive <laughs> i think that's pretty good who would you rather see live than over any other comedian which stand up uh norm mcdonald i wish he was still alive that'd be good i guess uh probably rory dude I'd, seeing rory scovel's always like pisses me off watching him he's just the best at what he does and i try to like you know exist in that same kind of space that he does as far as improvising and being silly and every time i watch him i'm just like fuck he's doing it correctly i don't know what the fuck i'm doing i i have to check him out I, i'm ashamed to admit i don't know rory scoble but i oh that's all right man. Yeah, watch rory scoble. he put out a special called like rory scoble tries stand up for the first time and it's five uh it's like the it's a special he filmed over like five improvised shows in atlanta it's really good it's really mm. inspiring 
So I'm going to do something that I've never done before on the podcast, but okay. I'm feeling inspired by Kill Tony. And I put some questions in a bucket that I've written. Also, subscribers to the podcast have written uh, some Reddit questions thrown in there. And I'm just going to pick sure. them out randomly and see where it goes as we end off. All right. So this is my this is my stand in uh, perp bucket. I'm not gonna look. Hmm. If someone offered you a hundred million dollars to not see any of your friends or family for two years, would you take it? Do I get to see other people? Am I like locked yes. in a room? Yeah, you can see anyone besides your closest friends and family. Yeah, I mean, I assume that like I don't just disappear. I can probably like tell them, hey, I'm going away for two years. But when I come back, I'll have a hundred million dollars. Yeah, for mm. sure. Yeah, because like when do I get that hundred million dollars? Do I get it as part of the end of, this? of the do two years up front at the end, at of, the the end of the two yeah. years? Yeah. Yeah, I think that I just tell them, hey, I'm doing something that's good for our family. And when I return, no one will ever have to work ever again. Uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like, I think like the sentimental, like, uh, you know, sweetheart, uh, <laughs> answer would be no, no. But I mean, like my wife would be like, yes, you have to do that. My sister would be yeah. like, of course. Yeah. You know, she'd be like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be okay. Just make sure you split the cash when you get back. But then you also might fall out of love with that person. That's difficult. After that mm. two year period and everything's different, you know, also you never get time back. You know, maybe my dad dies during that time. I don't know, man. The more I think about it, that'd be very difficult. I probably would fuck. I don't know. I'd have to have a very serious conversation with everyone that I care about and then let them influence it. My gut says yes, but I think that the actual answer would probably end up being no. I mean, my niece is going to grow up. She's going to go from two and a half to four and a half. I don't get that time back. You yeah. can't buy that time back. Yeah, I guess no. It's fuck. tough. It's tough. Such it's a, it's a fucking good... pussy. <laughs> it's a good question. No, it's a, it's a, it's a good, it's a, t I don't even know if I know the answer for me because yeah. it two years is just enough to make you think one year. It's like, I'll see you next November one year, hundred right. million dollars. Like, fuck yeah. Nothing's really, but two years, it's like just an, an extra amount of time, like just the right amount to make you think like, fuck, like two years shit happens one year. Like, yeah, shit could happen, but, like, what could really happen in a year? People spend a year apart. They get back together. Like, but two years is, it's a lot. Yeah. I mean, a year, easy. Of course. I don't even yeah. talk to him about it. I just leave a note on the counter and say, yeah. I'll be gone for 365 days. When I'm back, it's all going to be different. Yeah. <laughs> a note that says, one year from now, we will ball out and never work again. Yeah. And yeah, like, Dad, the house is covered. Sophie, you're going to own the salon. You know, Emily, you don't have to be a doctor anymore. We can just fucking get a house in the south of France and ride around on boats. 100%. And also, then I don't have to do stand-up anymore. And for that, that year, I could just be on the road doing stand-up and, like, become the best at it and then film a special and then walk away. <laughs> that, yeah. Yeah, one year would be easy. Two's tough. Good question, whoever wrote that. I think that was... I have to look if that was a subscriber or a Reddit question. I should write that on the the fucking thing from now on um what person do you think could easily become president if they decided to run oh like jake paul probably i don't know uh, think so yeah i mean anyone who has a cult of personality behind them who's handsome uh i bet a kardashian could become president i just i feel like the majority of voters uh are into spectacle and I think that we have no collective belief in the president actually being anything but a figurehead, you know? I think that they're all pretty impotent and we realize that they don't really impact us in any way. The decisions they make don't really impact us unless like you're incarcerated or very poor or very rich, you know? I think people are just like going down the middle. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like probably Jake Paul. If I had to set a line on Jake Paul becoming president, it'd probably be like plus 350. Mm. I mean, it would be fun to watch him call out fucking like Rick Rubio or Tulsi Gabbard to a professional fight to settle the election process rather than. Oh, have dude, I mean, it just it. like it, it just showed how much we love huckster showmanism that, uh, you know, that Trump was able to become president. 
because he just he was just he was a better live act than the competitor you know yeah yeah, yeah he de- the enter- entertaining as fuck for sure i mean i set the bar pretty low for who could become president of the united states when's the last time you felt truly free uh last time i felt truly free i don't know dude i feel pretty good whenever i wake up on monday and i don't have to go do anything you know what i mean like i come back off the road on sunday sleep in my own bed wake up can just go right i mean i feel it's gonna sound shitty but i feel pretty free most days because i just like chill and wait for my wife to get home and like if i want to write i can write if I want to podcast, I can podcast. If I want to uh, just go on a long bike ride and read in the park, which I do quite often, like I'm pretty pretty lucky that I've you know worked so fucking hard to uh, not have a lot of like responsibilities. Yeah, man. I mean, that doesn't I'm not, sound like, shitty rich or at all. Anything, you know, like I, well, it sounds. I mean, if you're like, I, th- I if I heard someone say that, I'd be like, I fucking hate this guy, but. You know, like I rode my bike down today and someone stopped me on the street to give me a baguette because they owned a bakery. That was pretty freeing. That felt pretty good. Yeah, I mean, you you front loaded thousands of open mics to fucking be where you are today. And you're spending your time doing what you want rather than, you know, have to be in an office at 847 every morning. Yeah. Fucking. And I mean, it's like, I guess freedom is like. You know, it's on a scale, right? Like, I, 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 it's not like I have the freedom to, like, fly to fucking Japan if I want to right now. Like, I can't, like, buy a one-way ticket somewhere and just go live there. But I do have the freedom to, like, you know, ride around and not have to go do anything. But I do have to have dinner on the table, you know? That's, that's one thing I have to do every day. That I get to do every day. I like that. Yeah, you get to do it. Yeah. What's your ultimate goal in life? And would you take 10 years off your lifespan to achieve it? No, fuck no. I, mean, I probably already have, dude. <laughs> I mean, I think that I've traded in some uh, of my golden years for uh, for the life that I've created for myself. I mean, I feel like I've, I don't know. It's one of those things, if you like told me when I was 22 what I'd be doing right now, I'd be like, oh, wow, you did it. You've, you've, mm. You're you've living the dream, you know? So, Yeah. I think my goal is to like, you know, do what I'm doing now, just create for a living and uh, yeah, not have to like, you know, go to a job. I like that. I'm pretty happy with that. I, I, but so I, yeah, like I probably have traded some years of my life to achieve that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it also depends how long you're going to live, which you never know. But if it's the difference between me living to 90 and 100, do I really want the last 10 years at 90 being sick and not being able to do anything if that's the case i hope it's not but if i had some glimpse into the future of how fulfilling the last 10 years of my life would be then perhaps i would do that but if i don't have that opportunity to see the future then i would say no i'll I'll take my chances no for sure if they told me hey you have this much time we're gonna take 10 away that would be I mean, first of all, fuck, that'd be brutal to know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't think that I would like shave any time off this gift that is life. What's the most embarrassing or awkward situation you've been in public? Oh, Jesus. I don't know. That's one of those questions that you write it down and you submit it and you're like, hell yeah, this is going to be great, you know, fodder for them to discuss. But uh, I don't know. I feel like some of the most, you know, I've, uh, you know, I've I've walked in on a woman who I thought was uh, deeply in love with me and she shows up to a comedy show and she has, uh, you know, her boyfriend who actually lives in Iceland on her arm. You know, that's happened to me. Mm. I don't know if that's embarrassing. That's painful. It was very awkward, you know, to be like, oh, hey, who's this? Oh, this is my boyfriend of two and a half years. Interesting. Okay. So when I proposed marriage to you a week ago and you said, oh, we should, LOL, you know, uh, yeah, that was was pretty rough. Um, Was it it like a half-hearted proposal, like joking around? It's one of those things you say when you wake up in the morning and you're eating croissants and reading each other fucking poetry and drinking tea and you're like, we should just go get married right now. Let's just go down to the fucking courthouse. And she's like, mm. we should, you know, but God, I don't have a dress, you know. In that moment, it feels like it was real. Yeah. 
and then you find and I've out. had this no, uh, no. I've had this partner in Iceland for five years and yeah that's yeah uh, that's that that you know that fits awkward for sure mm-hmm very awkward I was depanced once in like fourth grade and everyone saw my tiny boy penis that was pretty bro that was that was rough uh, that's rough I'm trying to think yeah I mean I've definitely had a few and like ultimately embarrassing and awkward um i mean i i've had a few i used to be terrified of not just public speaking but having something written for me to read where i wouldn't have to think about it off the top of my head just having to read something in front of the class made me freeze up and i had a moment where i was reading from the literature short story book in ninth grade everyone would go down the row and read two minutes and then you just pick off where the last person ended off and i remember feeling like i was gonna pass out and my cheeks just got so red and i stumbled and just stopped way before my two minutes were up and just went back to my seat and the teacher didn't say anything but i knew in my head like everyone knows that i'm a little pussy right now <laughs> like <laughs> just just a fucking bitch i couldn't read for two minutes i think i read I for like 37 very... seconds yeah and that's i mean yeah i feel you on that that's a very human that's a very like common uh phenomenon i think i, I don't think you're alone in that one just yeah just like the feeling of I don't know, like, like an insane rush of panic and then just stopping so I didn't pass out and then just not starting again and just being like, all right, I'm done. And oh, yeah. that sticks with me for I sure. I loved it. I loved reading aloud. That was the best. I was all for that shit. Yeah, I fucking sucked at it. Right, let's, do, uh, <laughs> let's do a couple more. What's the last thing that made you cry? Oh, uh, my niece, uh, they sent me, they, they sent me and my wife a video of my niece and she, uh, was wearing a Halloween costume that we bought her cause she loves princesses. And she said, thank you, uncle Hammy. And I cried really hard at that. I never That's cry beautiful. out of sadness. I always cry because I'm so like overwhelmed with like great gratitude or whatever. <laughs> Yeah. I get manipulated by commercials real easy. Like, you know, if it's like a soldier surprising his wife or his kid, that'll fucking get me. <laughs> I'm so easily manipulated. And I allow myself to be na- manipulated emotionally because it feels good sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm similar with that where I cry more on the happy end. And sometimes when I'm sad, I wonder why I'm not crying. Like when other people that are more normal would cry. I'm just like... I. Like a normal person would cry right now because this is so sad, but like I feel sad, but it's I'm just not making me cry. But I, but my threshold for crying with happy stuff is just way lower. Oh, for sure. I mean, I know why I don't cry when I'm sad because my mom would always be like, nothing gets solved when you're crying. And it's like, yeah, this feels a bit self-indulgent. Like no. what, what, what good is this doing me like crying right now? Because I'm bummed, but that's probably not healthy. <laughs> cathartic, cathartic release, something like that. Yeah. All right, let's do, uh, let's get a good one. Oh, okay. If you're on death row and instead of a last meal, they said you get to do one hour of any activity you want, but not including any family or friends, what would you do? Not including any family or friends. Yeah, like you can't involve them in the activity. Just one hour of anything you want to do on okay. death row, the last thing before you get the chair. I guess I would want to sit on a beach as the sun is going down. I'd like a half hour of sunset on a beach, and I'd like to have a nice – so I'd like to have like a nice meal. I guess there's no last meal involved. Yeah, on a beach, one cold beer – uh half hour of sunset and then the water's warm enough that i can go swimming or maybe i'll I'll probably be in the water in the ocean for that entire hour actually that's what i'd want to do if i had to face death i'd probably want to do an hour in like a nice warm water just floating like an egg as the sun goes down that's Mm. that's, that'd be my move yeah and also fucking chain smoking cigarettes mm, because i don't smoke cigs anymore but if I'm going say, down, I'm I'm burning heaters the whole fucking hour before I'm put down. 
I was going to say there's definitely whiskey and cigarettes involved in mine. I yeah. absolutely love the feeling of snowboarding and, and being in the cold and then ripping a shot of whiskey on the lift oh, and just yeah. feeling like the dichotomy of the coldness and the warmth just seeping through your body. And yeah. so if I could control the climate, <laughs> I would have a mountain like somewhere out in Colorado, in, uh, Rockies, you know, Vale or Squaw Valley, somewhere like that. That's just like perfect oh, yeah. snow, rip some whiskey, have the perfect run down to the bottom on a big ass mountain where it takes me 10 to 15 minutes to get down and then turn that into a beach. Like the uh, if the bottom of the mountain could just unfold into a beach and just Oh, kind of like yours, just like chain smoking cigarettes, watching the sun go down yeah. on my life after ripping a nice run. Yeah. I think you can do that in Albania. I think there's places where like you can, I don't know. There's somewhere I've heard where you can like fucking ski to the beach. Yeah. I mean, that sounds perfect to me, dude. That sounds well, perfect. Well, I hope I never get the death penalty, but if I do, then I hope I'm in Albania and I hope they, and, uh, they, they start that rule. <laughs> The one hour. Well, yeah, but the beauty of it is if, if you have that run, that last like snowboard run, you have a chance to escape. You know what I That's mean? That's true. I could pull like a yeah. fucking Vin Diesel triple X, just explosions all around me, grinding rails, going over houses, people, yeah. you know, like machine, like helicopters. There's six helicopters over my head that somehow can't hit me with a single bullet or a missile. And I'm just fucking like weaving in between a hailstorm of ak 47s and then i'm just like guys just leave me alone for 30 minutes so i can enjoy this sunset and then take me out <laughs> well yeah i mean that's a much cooler way to put it i was yeah. just thinking maybe like <laughs> you just like go off of the slope and go into the woods and try and disappear yeah. for a bit but no i yeah. like yours better yours is good yeah i'd, I'd hire, probably put some hire kind a bunch of, like, of actors on you <laughs> yeah <laughs> Hire a bunch of actors. Um, I, th this just popped into my head because we're talking about the the hundred million dollar thing and like triple X Hollywood shit like that. One of the things that I would love to do if I had money, like a hundred million dollars, would be to pull an insane prank and make one of my best friends think that a zombie apocalypse was actually happening. So I would have oh, to wow. hire about like ten thousand actors with yeah unreal makeup just planted outside their apartment like have the budget to burn down buildings rebuild them like move people out just like have my friend walk out into a zombie apocalypse and for an hour to just make him think that the world is turning <laughs> and just film it put cameras everywhere like it'll be the oh, ultimate dude. fucking <laughs> that's great that's fucking great. <laughs> Good for yeah. you. I love that idea. Yeah, like you just go around to fucking all the apartments. You're like, hey, here's a million dollars. Like, I mean, you need more than that in New York City. But what? What? I, here's ten million dollars. I'm gonna, you know, burn this apartment building, and we're gonna use it to shoot a scene where I pull a prank on my friend. And you know, I'll. Uh, you you have to hope that your friend doesn't kill themselves because like I could easily see that being something that I think about within the first hour. Like, do <laughs> yeah. I just if I walk out and see a bunch of zombies and I immediately close the door and be like, do I actually try to ride this out? <laughs> but <laughs> that would be I that would be something I, smart. If you can't take it with you, man, you got to have fun with the money. Yeah, I would blow an unproportional amount of the budget on that and yes, I'd still have like hopefully $60 million left and that would be enough. I would uh I would I would I would invest in that. If I had if I had 100 100 million dollars, I'd break you off a chunk of it to pull that off. Yeah. I feel like you'd have to perform some sort of ultimate prank, like just spend years designing it. You get the 100 million, 2 years from then, you have something in motion your version of the zombie prank, whatever it is, and it's just going to be the best fucking prank to ever happen. Yeah, no, I mean, it'd be very much fun to... Uh, <laughs> I think the best prank I could pull would just be to, like, uh, secede from society and disappear from stand-up and just, like, you know, live in uh, uh, somewhere on, like, the French Riviera and, like, own my own vineyard 
That'd be a fun prank. Only I would know I was pulling it off, but I'd be all for it. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. Well, Sam Talent, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast. This has been an absolute blast. Thank you for having me, Zach. Yeah, everyone. We've covered a lot of bases here. A hundred percent. We went from fucking anarchy to comedy to zombies to, um, you know, covered a lot of bases. Again, everyone, go check out Running the Light. Yeah, samtalent.com. samtalent.com and then go yeah. check out Waiting for Death to Claim Us. Check out the the Instagram. I'll have everything linked wherever you're listening to Yeah, this yeah, do me a favor follow my fucking this. Instagram so you know where yeah. I am. So yeah. that you can come see me perform standing up comedy. Yes. And I've already done that and you should do that too. And I'm telling I I realize I'm a hypocrite. Uh well I mean, a hypocrite in many ways, but the the latest way that I've realized a hypocrite is that I've been talking about random suggestions in the algorithm, and I'm very yeah. bad at recommending things to friends out of the blue. So I sure. will text I will text friends to check out this book and leave a review because that's something that I have yet to do yet, and I encourage people to do the same. Yeah, that would rule. I got a podcast, Chubby Behemoth. Uh, yeah, man. Thank you for having me, Zach. I appreciate it, dude. Yeah, this this was a blast. Hell yeah. Awesome.